Ah, this might be a more sedate uh, part of the afternoon, I trust. Uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion 15733 in the name of Hamza Youssef on management of offenders Scotland Bill. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Hamza Youssef to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, please. Always to date, uh, presenting officer, uh, I would like to say. Uh, can I say that uh, I really welcome uh, this debate, of course, I, I move the management of offenders. Scotland Bill, uh, in my name, uh, I'm very pleased to be opening this stage one debate uh, on the management of offenders. Bill, uh, the bill bring forward, brings forward a number of reforms designed to deliver on the Scottish Government's commitment to reduce reoffending, uh, ensuring that Scotland's justice system retains its focus on prevention and rehabilitation, whilst enhancing support for victims. Uh, in terms of the various elements of the bill, part one of the bill, as members no doubt will know, provides for the expansion of electronic monitoring as part of our continued development of community-based alternatives to prison. The electronic monitoring provisions of the bill provide an overarching set of principles for the imposition of electronic monitoring. The bill itself provides clarity as to when and how electronic monitoring can be imposed, uh, either by the courts in relation to criminal proceedings or indeed uh, by Scottish ministers in relation to release on licence from detention or indeed imprisonment. Uh, the bill also creates a standard set of obligations which clearly describe what is required of an individual who is subject to monitoring. The bill also empowers ministers to make regulations to specify the types of devices that can be used for the purpose of monitoring, the introduction of new technologies such as uh, global positioning systems, GPS technology, presents opportunities to improve the effectiveness of electronic monitoring. For example, through the use of exclusion zones that could offer victims significant reassurance uh, and indeed respite. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, part two of the bill provides for progressive reforms to the system of disclosure of conviction of previous convictions. The reforms in part two aim to provide a much better balance between improving the life prospects of those with convictions, balanced of course with the important need uh, for public safety. The reforms proposed in the bill will reduce the length of time most people with convictions have to disclose the offending history, bringing more people within the scope of the protections not to disclose at all, and making the regime more transparent and easier to understand. These reforms will help unlock untapped uh, potential in Scotland's people, helping them move on more quickly from their offending behaviour to assist the economy, uh, improve their life chances, and help reduce reoffending rates, and ultimately, of course, that uh, will hopefully mean uh, less victims as well. Of course, the point. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Uh, and I accept the points that he makes around disclosure and indeed electronic monitoring for those points. But I was wondering if you might reflect that in order to truly achieve the, those things, a much broader suite of assistance must be provided with people leaving prison if we're going to achieve that rehabilitation beyond simply disclosure and electronic tagging. Cabinet Secretary. I, I heard Daniel Johnson make similar points in, in various committee sessions. I, I think he's absolutely right. There's an onus uh, on government and indeed all the stakeholders to think about the wider support. Uh, you know, all these measures from, from the bill that we discussed on, on, on Tuesday in relation to, to the vulnerable witnesses, uh, right the way through to, to, to this particular bill, uh, can never be seen in isolation. They're always going to be part of a wider suite of packages of, of, of measures. So, yes, I, I agree with the point that he's, he, he, he very much uh, he makes well and, and, and articulates well. Um, in, in terms of, of, of these particular uh, reforms, uh, this particular bill, sorry, I'll move on to, to part three. Uh, the, the Pro Board is the focus of part three of the bill, uh, and the Pro System, I should say, is the focus uh, of, of, of part three. Uh, the Pro Board reforms delivered uh, on the Scottish Government's commitment to uh, improve the effective rehabilitation and reintegration of people who have committed offences and complete the implementation of the Pro Board reform project to modernise and improve support for the vital work uh, of the Pro Board. Uh, the, the, the bill also aims to simplify and modernise processes and support a consistency of approach in relation to Pro Matters uh, and the Pro Board for Scotland. They specifically amend the tenure of uh, board members that brings them in line uh, with other tribunals, uh, reinforce the independence of the board uh, and provides for the administrative and accountability arrangements for the board uh, to be set out in secondary legislation. Uh, I welcome the very comprehensive report of the Justice Committee. Uh, I would now like to set out our thoughts, the government's thoughts, on some of the important matters raised. 
in the committee's report. The committee asked for early, for early review as to whether HDC guidance for governors is striking, and I quote, the right balance uh, and sought reassurances from the Scottish Government that lessons learned from the inspectorate reports will be applied to other areas where electronic monitoring may be used. Uh, the Chamber will be aware that following the tragic murder of Craig McClellan, the police and prisons inspectorates made 37 recommendations in relation to home detention uh, curfew, uh, and, and they were primarily for uh, the Scottish Government, the Scottish Prison Service, uh, and Police Scotland, and all three bodies, all three organisations, uh, have accepted all of those recommendations in full. Uh, guidance on HDC was updated in October 2018 following the recommendations, and there was an initial decrease in the number of those being granted release on HDC. We responded immediately to the issues raised in the independent reports by the inspectors, and the balance for our responses was in favour, of course, of public safety. We're continuing to assess the impact of the presumptions introduced in that guidance. An extensive review of the guidance around HTC, which was one of the inspectorate recommendations, is very much underway. HTC release decisions must have regard to protecting the public at large, preventing reoffending by the prisoner, and securing the su successful, <coughs> excuse me, successful reintegration of the prisoner into the community. We are led by the best available evidence about how to weight those considerations, and some are complementary. Uh, rehabilit uh, some are complementary. Uh, rehabilitation is an important way of protecting the public from reoffending. Uh, I am happy to reassure the chamber that any lessons from other areas of the system will be applied as the electronic, uh, electronic monitoring service develops. Public protection is, of course, a key element of the criminal justice system. Um, I will, as the committee requested, consider whether key principles and weight given to public protection should be given greater prominence in the bill. However, the need to consider public protection is already set out in legislation underpinning HDC and indeed in the HDC guidance. It's therefore an existing legal requirement that a risk assessment must always be done prior to the grant of HDC and the electronic monitoring of an individual under an HDC licence. I have, I have already written to the committee with further information about the ongoing work on risk assessment tools. I'm also happy to take forward the suggested discussions. Uh, in just one second, I'll just finish this point and I'll let Donna Johnson in. Uh, I've written to the committee with that further information. I'm also happy to take forward the suggested discussions with colleagues from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and social work colleagues as to what further information may be made available. I'm, I'm very clear that though any changes must be informed uh, by uh, the Risk Management Authority advice uh, on the relationship that such information presents to the risk of harm. And of course, I give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary again for giving way. Recommendation 5 from the HMI PS report stated that given the additional HDC licence conditions were not monitor, monitored, it was doubtful that they serve any purpose. I hear what he says about risk management and the considerations, but surely monitoring is just as important. Is he satisfied that monitoring is now in place? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'm, I'm satisfied that uh, the appropriate lessons from the inspectorate report are not just learned, but are very much being taken uh, away and, and, and are underway. Those changes are, are very much being, being made uh, by, by the organisations, primarily SPS uh, and, and, of course, um, uh, where necessary, Police Scotland uh, also. But that is, you know, not just, you, you don't have to take my word for it. I have been very keen on the back of, uh, to str very keen to stress on the back of those reports uh, that at the six month mark, uh, my expectation and my request to the inspectorates is that they follow it up as independent inspectorates. And then of course, I'm happy to present to the parliament in terms of, uh, of that. Um, I have also already written to the committee with details of the revised guidance for criminal justice social work and responding to breach. That guidance clarifies a number of key roles and terms within the process. I've also indicated to the committee that I'll make further information, uh, uh, give them further information and make that available during stage two of the bill about our plans in respect of creation of an offence of unlawfully at large. <clears throat> the committee sought our view on whether the extension of electronic monitoring will result in more punitive sentencing. Uh, we don't believe it inherently will. Uh, ultimately, sentencing decisions are, of course, for the courts. The new GPS and remote substance monitoring capabilities extend the range of options open to the courts. We will continue to collect data on how, of course, these new capabilities uh, are and will be used. The committee also asked what additional resources have been made available for the implementation of the bill. 
it is not anticipated that the bill is currently drafted will immediately lead to a large-scale change in the manner in which electronic monitoring is used by the courts. However, when and if any new pilots of the new technology are taken forward, then appropriate funding will accompany those pilots. I can confirm that the budget for electronic monitoring has increased to six million in anticipation of these changes. In part two, a, a specific recommendation highlighted a concern raised by Scottish Women's Aid in the context of ensuring continuing appropriate levels of dis disclosure for those convicted of domestic abuse offences uh, and indeed other similar type offences. I can confirm steps are being considered for the future disclosure bill, uh, which is concerned with the higher level disclosure system to ensure appropriate disclosure does continue with no unintended consequences on higher level disclosure from changes to the system uh, of basic disclosures in this bill. Uh, MSPs can be reassured this consideration uh, will be informed indeed by the feedback offered, including of course uh, on the feedback uh, in this debate. On part three, I note the committee's view that victims should have a role in the parole process and also their comments that this bill is being considered when a detailed uh, consultation uh, of the parole board uh, is underway uh, and, and is due to be, uh, which was published on the 19th of December. Uh, yes, of course. Ian Kerr. Scottish Women Aid there. Um, does he share their view that cutting off a tag should be an offence? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I will listen to what Scottish Women's Aid and indeed other members uh, have to say this. Uh, it was the Conservatives, uh, and give you know, uh, absolute credit where it's due here, that pushed the government uh, and others to look at unlawfully at large uh, becoming uh, an offence. I've just said in my speech that serious consideration uh, is being given to bringing that forward as an amendment, uh, amendment uh, at stage two. So uh, we, we just have to be careful about terminology uh, around uh, when technically somebody goes unlawfully at large versus the moment they may well cut off a tag. And, and, and there, is a, there is a nuance there. Uh, but of course, if the Scottish Women's Aid uh, have, have views on this, I have a, a good relationship uh, with them. And, and of course, I'll listen carefully to what members have to say in this chamber uh, about that. But I intend to bring forward an amendment from the government to, to stage two uh, on going unlawfully, uh, 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 of, of unlawfully at large being an offence. Yes. John Finney. Thank you, I'll get for the Cabinet Secretary taking an intervention on the Pro Board. Would the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that at the moment there is a role for victims in the parole system? It's not that this is going to introduce something that isn't already there. Yeah, yeah, Before yes, you respond, Cabinet Secretary, yeah. I say to member, if you'd sit down, please, to say to members there is some time in hand, so don't be anxious if you take intervention, she'll still make up your time. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. Uh, it's a really important point made by, by, by John Finney. Uh, and depending on, 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 on the case, that representation can take different forms. Uh, of course, uh, we know that, uh, but there is, of course, uh, the, the, the opportunity for victims to, to make representation to the Pro Board. And, and, you know, I should record here uh, very much my, my, my thanks to, to the Pro Board Scotland and indeed the team, because that is a really difficult job. I think all of us uh, who are in this chamber would recognise that making these decisions uh, is, is not an easy thing uh, at all to do, uh, but they do it, uh, and, and, and I think it's to their credit, uh, the, the manner in which they do it. Now, that does not mean, and I've spoke to, to, to many uh, members of the Pro Board uh, in my time uh, as Cabinet Secretary, uh, and they all recognise that there can be significant improvement including in terms of the voice of, of, of the victim. But John Finney makes a, a hugely uh, an important point. And, and just on that point, uh, I've, I've, heard, I've, I've held a number of meetings with uh, victims and, and victims' families. Um, and from speaking to them, it's clear that they want a greater voice uh, within that uh, parole uh, system. We're always looking at ways to improve things, and that's why parole processes are continually kept uh, un, un, under review. These meetings are directly informed, actually, the content of the current consultation uh, un underway. I also listened carefully to the evidence given uh, and committee's views on the removal of the psychiatrist member of the board. Uh, however, I feel the parole board currently has the expertise it needs to assess cases appropriately without a statutory requirement for a specific type of member. I will, however, seek the views uh, of the parole board on ways we can further enhance the role of psychiatrists and other mental health professionals in parole board assessments. Turning uh, briefly to the test for release, uh, statutory tests do exist, as members probably know, for life sentence prisoners and equivalent sentences, including orders of lifelong restriction uh, and for recalled extended uh, sentence prisoners. However, I'm not convinced that a standard test is necessary for all other categories of determinate sentence uh, prisoner 
uh, any common test would have to work for each category of prisoner considered by the board, uh, such as those subject to transfer under the Mental Health Scotland Act uh, 1984, or young offenders and children subject to a period uh, of detention. There are reasons for having a test for the release of life prisoners and extended sentence prisoners who've been recalled, namely that they are potentially held in custody beyond the punishment part or custodial part that the court has set. Now, I do not believe that we should assume that a statutory, te statutory test exists for the release of some categories of prisoner. One must exist for all prisoners and, and be in identical terms. The nature of a life uh, or extended sentence is different to that of a determinate sentence. Uh, in response to the parole reform consultation, the Law Society of Scotland uh, itself was against the introduction of a common statutory test for all prisoners uh, and highlighted the reason why certain types of sentences uh, must be treated differently. <coughs> uh, the, a test for release of each category of prisoners set out in legislation would determine the scope of any decision by the Pro Board. Uh, however, I believe the Pro Board uh, should be able to consider and weight any factors it thinks uh, is relevant. Uh, Rule 8 of the Pro Board, Scotland Rules 2001, sets out in legislation matters which can be taken into account by the Board in dealing with the case. It does not, however, provide a definitive list and the Pro Board may take into account any other factors that it considers uh, relevant. So while I agree that further information being available uh, as to the array of factors the Pro Board takes into account may be useful uh, and could indeed uh, be published uh, elsewhere, such as guidance, uh, I do not believe that setting out a test in statutory legislation for each category of prisoner uh, is the best way to achieve this. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Deputy Planning Officer, uh, this bill takes forward a number of important changes to improve the criminal justice system in Scotland. I'm pleased to note that the Justice Committee recommends that the general principle of the bill be agreed to at stage one. Uh, and once again, Deputy Presiding Officer, I move the motion uh, in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee. Convener, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee in today's Stage 1 debate on the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. I thank all those who gave written or oral evidence, and the Committee also thanks both the WISE Group and G4S for hosting a visit which helped members understand more about the use of electronic monitors or tags and the impact of disclosing prior convictions. This provided an opportunity at the very beginning of our consideration of the bill to hear firsthand about the challenges people with prior conditions face in trying to reintegrate into society. Finally, my thanks to the Justice Clerks and to past and present committee members for their work in producing this report. Before moving on, the committee again wants to record our condolences to the family and friends of Mr Craig McClelland. Craig's tragic murder led to two independent reviews by the Inspectorates of Prison and Constabulary. Thereafter, in June 2018, the committee suspended its stage one scrutiny until the publication of the important review findings um, were, were available. And our thoughts were very much with Craig when finalizing our recommendations. I confirm therefore that this stage one report takes into account both the review group's findings and recommendations. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice has stated he fully supports and will implement all the views, uh, reviews recommendations. The committee has made clear that it will hold him and others such as the Scottish Prison Service and Police Scotland to these commitments and crucially press for swift implementation of these recommendations. Turning now to part one of the bill, this proposes changes to electronic monitoring, allowing the government to expand its use, to bring in new technologies such as global positioning system, GPS, and transdermal technology, which can help monitor those with drug and alcohol problems. Where electronic monitoring, EM for short, is used as an alternative to custody, the committee recognised the necessity to balance any potential benefits and public protection. Whilst the Committee on Balance supports part one of the bill, in doing so, members added the following vitally important qualifiers to that support. The committee recognises that the weight given to the considerations of public protection, punishment and rehabilitation may vary 
depending on the different situations where EM might be used. The committee is decisively of the view that electronic monitoring should only be used after a comprehensive risk assessment, particularly in relation to home dissension curfews and other orders where the individual would otherwise be incarcerated. Re yes, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I thank uh, Margaret Mitchell for, for, for giving way, and I, I don't disagree with um, the committee's recommendations. Would she agree with me that even if all of these, which there will be, all these recommendations uh, are put in place uh, and there is a further robustness to the HDC regime and other electronic monitoring regimes, that does not necessarily eliminate the risk completely and entirely. <clears throat> Margaret Mitchell. The Cabinet Secretary, there's never a situation in life where risk can totally be, uh, totally be eliminated. But having said that, the point is the assessment test that we put out and uh, the measures around that have to be absolutely robust, especially in the situation of ADCs. So robust assessment procedures are therefore critical to the use of HDCs and electronic monitoring. Furthermore, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to liaise with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service about providing criminal justice social workers with summaries of evidence from court cases to inform the preparation of any risk assessments. I think it was a little worrying that sometimes they had to rely on information on, from the offenders themselves. A robust professional need needs risk assessment on the suitability of an individual for EM as part of their sentence is critical and that there is careful risk assessment practice including home visits to inform decision making regarding EM curfew arrangements. The committee also calls on the Scottish Government to consider whether key principles and the weight that should be given to public protection and risk assessment should be given greater pro prominence. This includes assessing whether the provisions on risk assessment should, as with the monitoring of people on electronic tags, be in the bill. And I think the, the Cabinet said he was prepared to look at that in his statement. Monitoring and evaluation are important issues, particularly given the HMIPS's findings, which noted that where an individual released on HD, uh, HDC was made subject to additional conditions, there appeared to be no monitoring of compliance. The, the committee considers this unacceptable. Consequently, it recommends additional condi con conditions need to be accompanied by monitoring arrangements and that these are agreed to and put in place in advance and clearly annotated on the, the license. If this is not possible, the committee recommends serious consider consideration be given to not granting HDC. The committee, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to consider making provision for statutory guidance in the Bill requiring the Government to consult, maintain and make guidance on the roles and uh, responsibilities of relevant agencies with regard to risk assessment and monitoring or conditions relating to the use of electronic monitoring. Turning now to breaches of electronic monitoring orders, the committee recommends any breaches have to be swiftly investigated and when found to be substantive, for example, not due to a technical fault, are responded to quickly and effectively. The committee notes the powerful evidence from Scottish Women's Aid and others expressing concerns over the use of GPS and exclusion zones in cases involving domestic abuse or sexual offences. These concerns focused on how breaches will be responded to in real time where an offender has entered an exclusion zone. The public will not have confidence in the use of EM if the relevant authorities are not seen to investigate all breaches swiftly and respond without delay to substantive ones. In response, the committee wants progress made on the development of the new risk assessment tool and seeks details before stage three and statutory guidance on the roles and responsibilities of the different agencies and how they work and communicate together. 
The committee supports in principle the introduction of the new unlawfully at large offence whereby someone has breached their home detention curfew and perhaps removed their tag. However, given the divergence of opinion between Police Scotland and the Law Society of Scotland about the merits of this new offence and the wider police powers of entry and search and other related issues, the committee will consider the amendment the government proposes to Lord Jack stage two. Uh, this would not preclude taking further evidence. Part two of the bill deals with changes to the basic regime, regime of disclosures of convictions. These changes do not affect high level disclosures, where checks are made for some categories of employment and proceedings which require greater scrutiny of an individual's background. However, the, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to respond to comments by Scottish women say that clarity is needed on the impact of the changes on high level disclosure for some categories of domestic abuse offences. A delicate balance needs to be struck between risk and the need to integrate people with prior convictions back into society. These are very real challenges faced by people in relation to disclosure. Getting beyond the initial application itself is a challenge. The committee therefore welcomes efforts to tackle people not even being interviewed for employment to see if they are suitable merely by dint of ticking a box disclosing a prior conviction. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, during our visit to the Wise Group in Glasgow, we heard evidence from people with prior convictions and from their prison mentors that putting a monitor on someone and then releasing them into the community with no money no job, nowhere to live, no access to GP services or drug or alcohol support if they need it is simply just setting them up to fail. In conclusion, the committee considers that there is a danger that the good intentions of the Scottish Government in relation to increased electronic monitoring will not succeed if those wearing the devices are not fully supported and adequately monitored, including rapid and effective responses to breaches. Insufficient resource provision may result not just in a failure for individuals wearing the device, but could also represent an increased risk to community. Notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's comments today, therefore, the committee urges the Cabinet Secretary to look at resourcing and all members agreed that the government must make it clear what additional resources can be set aside in 2019-20. The committee supports the general principles of the bill. Thank you very much. I now call Liam Kerr to open for the Conservatives. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak for the Scottish Conservatives on the Management of Offenders Bill. Today, we will vote in favour of the principles of the Bill, uh, but I need to be absolutely and unequivocally clear. Our Stage 1 vote comes with significant caveats, and any further support is highly conditional. The bill is in three parts, dealing in reverse order and ease of disposal. Part three makes small reforms to the parole board, removing the requirement to include a high court judge and a psychiatrist, as well as moving to a five-year term for members. I don't have any problem voting for this, but uh, I respectfully suggest I think it's a missed opportunity. Presiding officer, last summer, in response to a number of tragic events, I joined the Stewart family in calling for Michelle's law. Indeed, I led a members debate in this chamber where I set out the three demands of the campaign. These included that parole reform must go further to give victims a greater say over temporary release uh, from prison and parole. And in response, the government announced in December that it planned to consult on the openness and transparency of the parole board and the involvement of victims of crime in its work. I also recall that the committee heard evidence from Petal who suggested that victims of crime might have a place on a parole board and a hearing. And the committee also recommended further work be done to consider the tests used by the parole board when releasing a prisoner. But all of that will be undertaken separately. So we will support what is being done in part three, but I cannot help but feel that this was an opportunity to take a step back and review the whole parole board and its operation and bring forward a bill directly related to that area. Uh, and I, I think we're still waiting for any movement from the government on the process, the parole process of temporary release. So, Cabinet Secretary. 
Hamza Yusuf. I, I thank Liam Kerr uh, for giving way. And he, he knows I, I take what he says uh, very seriously on this issue, and I've, I've met with the Stuart uh, family, family also. I think part of the, the concern, and I wonder if he accepts this, is that we already delayed this bill, understandably so, because of the HTC inspected reports that were taking place. To delay it further for, for, for parole board consultation, much of which, I think much of which is being asked for by the Stuart family and indeed other ma matters in that consultation do not need legislation. Does he not agree that perhaps delaying the bill even further at a time where the, that committee is, is already under legislative pressure uh, would have been the wrong move if we can actually achieve what he wants, what, the family want, what families want, but uh, it's without delay of, of legislation at a time where we actually don't have much time in this parliament at all? Liam Kerr. I understand the point being made, Cabinet Secretary, and, and, it, and it is a reasonable point, um, but equally I'm sure he will understand the point that I do have, and, and throughout, this, throughout my presentation today, uh, I will make this point several times, that perhaps there has been a missed opportunity here because we have three separate standalone things happening within one bill uh, that perhaps might have been dealt with separately uh, and perhaps better uh, by doing so. Looking at part two of the bill, uh, which again I think could have commanded its own separate uh, inquiry. This move to reduce sometimes the length of time one is required to disclose convictions makes sense, uh, as does the improvement in clarity of legal terms. And we know, and I, I recognise the Cabinet Secretary's comments in this regard, that getting a job and making a contribution to society in that way is one of the best routes out of offending behaviour. And striking the appropriate balance between societies or an employer's right to know about prior convictions with the ability of a person with convictions to move on is a, is a very difficult one. So I think it was right to refer to the regime change in England and Wales for reference to this. I think it's right that it only applies to the basic disclosure regime. And I think it's right, as the convener said, that a higher level disclosure system uh, isn't being looked at uh, at this stage. But I do note with some concern that the cabinet secretary said uh, that there is reform planned around this area and I flagged to the cabinet secretary that the report states the absence of any proposed changes to the higher level disclosure system was welcomed by a number of witnesses. It was and I'm bound to say I will take quite a deal of persuading to downgrade any such protections around higher level disclosures if that comes before us. Turning to the crux of this bill uh, which again, uh, may I say, I find it a little unfortunate this is not a separate bill in itself. Part one concerns the use of and provision of electronic, electronic monitoring of offenders. I reiterate we will support this bill and by extension part one at this stage. Uh, but Cabinet Secretary, I must be absolutely clear and unequivocal, this wasn't a decision I took lightly and I know my colleagues will not take it lightly this afternoon. We can only support this bill at stage one on the strict understanding that it is because we see an opportunity to improve it at stages two and three. And I, I need to put down this marker, if we don't see at stages two and three amendments that go far enough, we cannot support it. The Law Society put it succinctly, maintaining public safety is essential in whatever way that electronic monitoring is intended to be used. And that must surely be the starting point to ensure we enhance and protect public safety. I don't need to remind anyone in this chamber of the reasons why the original bill was postponed and further evidence taken. The shocking, unprovoked and devastating murder of Craig McClellan by James Wright, who was an individual with 16 previous convictions out on home detention curfew, wearing a tag with which he had tampered, roamed around uninhibited for six months, provides vital and awful context to this debate and to this bill. And it raised issues not just on home detention curfew, but on the wider use of tagging for all underlying orders and licenses. And I, if, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, I'll just digress slightly. The Cabinet Secretary will recall that Daniel Johnson, Willie Rennie and I wrote to him demanding an independent inquiry into this case in November last year. I think the family have written to the Lord Advocate just yesterday, as I don't think they've heard anything on this. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary will take the opportunity in closing to just update the family and the Chamber in this regard. Now, against that background, as we've heard, two reviews of the home detention curfew regime were conducted, which recommended various items, including the risk assessment process for HDCs being strengthened. 
And the Cabinet Secretary co told the committee he had ordered a presumption against violent criminals getting HDC and he'd consider the option of putting this on a statutory basis. And the report picks up that there'll be an examination of whether those presumptions should be statutory exclusions before May 2019. I find that too long, Cabinet Secretary. The bill is going through now and we have been asked to pass it without knowing what's coming and whether the full protections are in place. And furthermore, I understand that any new offence will only apply to home detention curfew. So as the bill stands, an offender on another underlying order or licence can cut off their tag without automatically committing an offence because it hinges on the underlying order. I don't think victims will accept that and I think it needs to change. Victim Support Scotland, Community Justice Scotland and Positive Prisons were crystal clear to the committee. There must be swift, visible, zero tolerance approach to breaches. And we believe that when a breach constitutes the removal of or tampering with the electronic tag, it must be an offence in itself, regardless of whether this is a custodial or community sentence. Cabinet Secretary, I heard your comments that uh, we will learn more in stage two, but I think these amendments must be brought forward and be suitably scrutinised on the public safety angle and be passed at stage two. On which note, I was terribly exercised in committee, and I don't think I'm alone in this, by the lack of the risk assessment uh, at this stage. We heard that the government agrees that the guidance document required extensive review to provide those charged with undertaking the assessment to release prisoners with more assistance. But it's not ready. And the Cabinet Secretary will remember the committee looked at this. I, I can't understand it because... Surely before we do anything that increases the numbers on electronic monitoring, we must have a robust and trusted assessment tool. And I think we need to see that covered before this bill passes. And on that decision-making process, something I struggled to understand throughout was no matter to whom or to which agency I posed the question, what is most important in considering release on HDC? Is it public protection, punishment or rehabilitation? I got an equivocal answer back because no one was saying to me, public protection is paramount, and I don't understand this. Uh, I heard the Cabinet Secretary say uh, he'll consider if public protection should be given greater prominence in the bill. I can help. It really should, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, my overriding concern, particularly because this bill remains unchanged from its initial form before all of the learnings came from tra tra tragedy, is I think this bill was brought forward by the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor in an atmosphere, dare I say, of complacency and with a view to extending tagging into inappropriate cases, perhaps driven by a simple wish to empty prisons. The landscape has changed fundamentally and our continued support predicates upon reassurance that this is about getting the regulation of tagging right and protecting public safety. To put electronic tagging on a basis that can command public support, to learn the lessons of tragic cases like Craig McClelland. The committee heard a great many promises from the Cabinet Secretary following what I thought was a very good committee inquiry. And those promises must be kept and we must see the further changes we are calling for. And if over the course of parliamentary scrutiny it looks like the opposite, we will vote against. I call Daniel Johnson, seven minutes please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking the clerks and my fellow committee members and that's always something that's important to do. But I think in particular in these circumstances, I think the committee had a difficult circum set of circumstances and, and uh, treated them appropriately, delaying and taking further evidence. And I think that was important. Can I pay particular tribute to the clerks? I don't think this was an easy report for them to compile, but they really did a truly excellent job. But this is an important debate about how we manage people who we send to prison, but more importantly, what happens to them when they transition back into our community. The expansion of electronic monitoring has the potential to make community justice more effective by increasing the options available to manage and monitor those people leaving prison. Significant rehabilitation and public safety benefits can be gained by transitioning someone back into society with the ability to monitor them through electronic monitoring. However, these benefits can never be allowed to overshadow the public's right to be protected. Public safety must be paramount and it must trump all other considerations. And I think this was tragically demonstrated by the circumstances of Craig McClellan's murder. The failure in the management of offenders can have devastating and disastrous consequences. So it's vital that we learn the lessons from the McClellan case. 
when the Cabinet Secretary was before the committee, I reflected um, my own feelings that of, of fa fail, having failed to ask the right questions when we were first considering this. I failed to ask the question of what happens when people currently breach these orders when they're on electronic tags. I think that was a significant omission. One, I think the committee corrected, but I think the government too must recognise its failure to consider some of these elements in, the, 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 in this bill and uh, the need to re-examination how effectively these, uh, uh, these uh, orders are being used and indeed how effective electronic monitoring is. Because it's clear from the HMICS and HMIPS reports that there were profound systemic failures in terms of process, interagency communication, and most fundamentally in the monitoring of people on HDC within the current system. The HMIPS report indicated that a robust assessment process to help identify which prisoners are most suitable for electronic monitoring was not in place and that SPS was not uh, uh, funded or staffed to undertake a more detailed multidisciplinary approach which was required. It highlighted that those making decisions to release an individual on HDC did not have access to all the relevant information, making it difficult for them to come to an informed decision. So let me be clear, while we support the broad aims and in principles of this legislation from these Labour benches. I feel it would be a dereliction of our duty as opposition members not to fully scrutinise whether this bill has adequately addressed the issues raised by both reports as this bill progresses. But importantly, I'm unconvinced that the changes uh, as a, a matter of policy or indeed the new offence that the Cabinet Secretary has brought, uh, proposed uh, will be sufficient. I think there are a number of recommendations made both by HMICS and HMIPS which may well require provision on the face of the bill, or certainly that would be enhanced by further legislative means. In particular, action on recommendations 5 and 14 of the HMIPS report and recommendations 1 and 9 of the HMICS need to be examined as to whether statutory guidance and clarification of statutory rules of agencies would help uh, make the system more robust. I would certainly argue that there needs to be uh, also a robust reporting regime, not just of the use of these measures, but also offences committed by those who are subject to them. This need for improved data, I think, is underlined by recommendation 21 in the HMIPS report. Furthermore, recommendation 11, suggesting a suspension of HDC for those giving an address outside Scotland, must also give cause for thought as to whether this is ever appropriate, given the inter-jurisdictional issues that have been identified. The improvements we need to see will not solely be addressed through legislation, but likewise there is a responsibility on all of us following the tragic circumstances of Craig McLean's death that, that we ensure that this bill is as robust as it needs to be and acts on the very serious faults that were found in these, through these investigations. But as a whole, I be also believe that this bill represents something of a missed opportunity. I think much as my colleague uh, Liam Kerr set out, there are three separate components which I think may have been better to be examined on their own and more holistically. Evidence strongly suggests that managing and monitoring offenders in the community can only ever be successful if it is part of a broader rehabilitation support package. A simple extension of electronic tagging by itself is far too narrow. The success of electronic monitoring will depend on adequate budgets being in place for criminal, and social, uh, uh, for, for criminal social work and the availability of wider services that support people who are subject to such measures. It is extremely disappointing in my view that this bill does little to address the underlying causes of re-offending. It fails to look at the broader issues of housing, healthcare, employment and other support measures uh, that should be made available to those leaving prisons. My conversation with prison services, uh, or services and organisations such as the Wise Group and Positive Prisons, and in particular can I pay tribute and thanks to the Wise Group for uh, uh, making it possible for me to shadow one of their prisoner uh, 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 mentors, uh, which was a, certainly a very revealing experience for me. But they support this view that we need to have a broader set of changes if we're serious about reform. So that is why Labour will be bringing forward... A, of course. Liam Kerr. Very grateful and I will be brief. Just in terms of uh, what we do going forward, uh, does the member agree with us that uh, it should always be an offence uh, for cutting a tag off? Daniel Johnson. I, I think there are some very compelling reasons to consider that point. And in, in, in the, in the fundamental point is this, is that those released subject to a condition 
as, as such as those set out in HDC, i.e. Uh, uh, where electronic monitoring is a substitute for incarceration, we have to treat the conditions of, of uh, that as similar to that prison, i.e. we have to treat someone in breach as though they have gone over the prison wall. That is as, uh, the seriousness with which we should treat breaching of these conditions. But put simply, in terms of the wider reform aspects, we cannot simply expect people to leave prison without knowing where they are going to live, how we, or how they are going to access medical services, or how they are going to support themselves, and assume that they are not going to re-offend. To do so is simply to set them up for failure, and I think that is an absolute dereliction of our responsibilities. But in conclusion, the expansion of electronic monitoring has some significant potential to improve our justice system but we must go much further than this bill currently does in order to achieve that. So let me be clear, Scottish Labour will be supporting this bill at stage one, but that support is not unqualified, nor is it unequivocal. This legislation requires further testing and further scrutiny to ensure that it upholds the recommendations that the two reports from HMICS and HMIPS have made very, very clear. Thank you. John Finney, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, presiding officer. Um, the Scottish Green Party will be endorsing the principles of this bill tonight. And, and indeed, are very supportive of the direction of travel um, and indeed the growing acknowledgement of the ineffectiveness of short-term prison sentences. So um, what, of course, we all agree in uh, is that there needs to be credible alternatives, first and foremost, to prosecution and then to uh, custody uh, and that we are making sure that the appropriate people are locked up and those who might otherwise not require to, to uh, be in custody have alternatives. And of course, key to that is the resource. And uh, one of the challenges I accept, and I, and I, and I think with good grace um, the other opposition parties will accept too, is albeit we've asked, it's going to be very difficult to quantify when that resource transfer takes place. You know, do we take one prison out of the equation and alter? Uh, the, uh, because as long as we have the bricks and mortar, then uh, we're, we're going to have that, that challenge. Um, and that challenge, of course, um, is also ab about the, the volume of court work that does take place. So the comment about the, the pivotal role that criminal justice social work play in issues and when we talk about getting a summary of um, uh, the, the reasons uh, why a conviction's been upheld, well, of course, that would be unnecessary if we had a criminal justice social worker in every court for every trial, following every case with an intimate knowledge of the individual that's coming there. So there's significant resources re re required, um, but that's not to say in the long term there aren't savings to be made, because I, I think, I, well, it, fairly early on in his speech, the Cabinet Secretary talked about the role of prevention. That's key. That's key. So the issues that colleagues uh, Daniel Johnson talks about, the, some of the, the causes behind this, yes, yes, of course, housing, employment, welfare issues are, are, are a pivotal part of this. I think some of my colleagues may be a bit critical of, of the format of, of, of the bill, you know. Um, yes, we sometimes get odd things joined together, but I, I think the overall, uh, there is a criminal justice element to all, all parts of this. I want to touch on the um, issue. Um, uh, first of all, commend early intervention, obviously, has, has been a key, key part. Um, I, we heard from Leanne Cullen um, of the Edinburgh Bar Association that would be very, and I quote, very concerning um, if a private company would hold the, a person's alcohol and drug use. Um, and so the extension to GPS, the ability to monitor the situation of someone's alcohol and drug consumption may seem a very straightforward uh, issue. But um, it wasn't just uh, um, the Edinburgh Bar Association. Also, we heard from uh, Dr. Hannah Graham from the Scottish Centre for Criminal Justice Research, who highlighted the fact that the privatised model that presently applies in Scotland uh, and indeed in England and Wales is out of step with other pe places where we would look. Um, as, as, uh, and we, we talked this week about the Barnhouse model. Um, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, progressive countries like that, it's, it's a public service. It's not something that profit is associated with. And as someone who's deeply uh, offended by the idea that people would profit from their involvement in the criminal justice system, I hope that's something that the, the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, will pick up on. And, and it's certainly something that I, I may well return at stage two regarding. Because, of course, it, it isn't just you know, private versus, versus public. It is about the growing volume of data that is available there and this the perennial issues about who has access to it, um, um, who, uh, the period of retention, 
Um, and of course, we already know that at the moment with the existing arrangement that there are challenges regarding the situation whereby an offender who is out in the community may find themselves in a hospital and there isn't that level of anyway. So it's not as if the existing arrangements aren't sufficiently challenging. So uh, I, I hope that's something that the, the Cabinet Secretary may uh, um, call on. And of course, con concerns have been voiced as well by the, the appropriate uh, um, oversight body for this. The Information Commissioners talked about it must only be processed uh, for law enforcement purposes. Um, and elsewhere we hear, uh, I, I think it's Article 8, a suggestion of um, the, the challenges there may be around about that. So um, I, I think it's a very, uh, a, a very pertinent fact I hope you'll pick up. I want, the short time I have, I want to talk about the, the astonishing turnaround in figures. Um, a 75% reduction in granting. Um, the removal from a presumption in favour to presumption against. Now, the tragic events which all of us um, would give our, our sympathy for, uh, we must not have a risk-averse public sector. If, if, if you know, it, it's throw away the key if we don't. There is nothing, as the convener acknowledged, that's entirely risk-free. And what we want is informed decisions made with the best possible information, the timely information. And, and I hope we see a turnaround by, uh, uh, on that. This isn't simply... I fear that a, tick, a, a risk assessment is going to be a tick box that is not going to be able to pick up on the peculiarities of any individual circumstances and the wide range of factors that may impact on the likelihood of them breaching um, or um, indeed the particular trying circumstances they may find themselves in whilst in hospital. So, uh, so a bigger pardon, whilst in, in custody. So I don't know how long, is there more time, um, presiding officer? Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Finney. I was involved in something else yeah, yeah, terribly yeah. important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can give you an extra minute. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> uh, well, in, in the short time that's left, I, I, I want to talk about the disclosure of convictions. And, and, and the, y y yes, um, the, the, the spent convictions. Um, I, I think that it's very important to say that there's a, a wide recognition that this is progress. But equally, it would be wrong to say, and somewhere among the many notes I've got, um, there, are, there are those, um, indeed the Howard League, Dr. Graham again, who say, that, that, you know, we could go further on this. Um, we, we want a situation where people leave custody without stigma. I absolutely commend, as others have, the words of Dr. Marsha Scott in relation to this and the significant difference there is around domestic abuse issues. But um, uh, I'll leave it there, President Officer. Thank you very much indeed. Liam MacArthur, seven minutes. Oh, sorry. I'm all over the place this afternoon. Six minutes, please. I'll not pass comment on that, Deputy President Officer. Um, like others, uh, let me start by thanking colleagues at Spice the Clarks uh, for their support uh, in our scrutiny of this important bill and all those uh, who's written in oral evidence has informed uh, that scrutiny process. As uh, Daniel Johnson and others have uh, remind us it's taken us rather longer to get to this uh, point uh, following the committee's decision to delay proceedings pending uh, the outcome of the two inquiries commissioned by the Justice Secretary into the tragic circumstances surrounding the brutal murder of Craig McClellan. That was absolutely right and proper. So clearly there's a, a limit to how far this bill can provide the answers the, the McClellan family uh, are rightly seeking. Uh, but I think that also only goes to underscore um, the need for a fatal accident inquiry into that case. We now know there are 127 outstanding FAIs going back as far as 2010, and the impact those delays have on the families who've lost uh, lo loved ones is unimaginable. But also, I think it prevents lessons being learnt and, where necessary, laws being changed, and that cannot uh, be right or acceptable. In terms of this bill, however, I think we need to be careful in managing expectations about what electronic monitoring can and will achieve. Ultimately, what we are talking about here is monitoring and management rather than control and prevention. Moreover, as we heard repeatedly in evidence, without other support in place, these measures can do little to help rehabilitate uh, and reintegrate. It's critical this is properly explained and understood, and if government and its agencies don't get that communication uh, right, there's a real risk of undermining uh, public confidence. Of course, at the heart of decisions around whether or not electronic monitoring is appropriate, appropriate lie assessments and judgments of risk. 
For those assessments to be robust, information and expertise has to be appropriately gathered uh, and shared. For example, seeking the views from everyone who may be affected, including family members, will be important in assessing suitability of any individual for electronic monitoring. Meanwhile, as the, uh, I think the convener reminded us, it was concerning to hear uh, criminal justice social workers in compiling reports uh, are often reliant on information provided by an offender uh, in the absence of summaries of evidence narrated in court, and I think that does need uh, addressing. The committee also heard evidence from various witnesses about the importance of ensuring that breaches carry consequences. Victim Support Scotland talked about the need for, quote, clear implications for imp uh, infringement of a buffer zone, while Karen McCluskey of Community Justice Scotland observed that, quote, non-compliance needs to be dealt with robustly, otherwise it will just increase. And these calls, I think, are understandable, as is the case made by Police Scotland for creating a separate offence of remaining unlawfully at large. Uh, this was obviously given added weight by the findings of the two inspectorate reports last autumn. But as the Law Society rightly cautioned, the detail of any such provision will need careful and robust scrutiny, as will proposals for extending police powers in relation to entry uh, and search. I have no difficulty uh, at all in looking to see how we improve the provisions of this bill in this area, but I suspect that we may need to take further oral evidence on the specifics of whatever the government uh, comes forward with at stage two. Turning to another couple of concerns raised repeatedly with us during our evidence gathering, let me start with the need to avoid electronic monitoring simply being added to existing community sentences. It was reassuring to hear the Justice Secretary acknowledge the risk uh, of what the Howard League and others uh, referred to as up-tariffing. Uh, ultimately, electronic monitoring should be about supporting efforts to find robust alternatives to imprisonment, not merely add-ons to restrictions on those already deemed suitable for uh, community sentences. The second recurrent theme uh, was that el electronic monitoring will only be effective if used alongside other support. This has been referred to by, I think, all colleagues so far. Families outside felt, for example, that the bill focused solely on surveillance and monitoring, adding, uh, uh, quote, without um, structured supports in place, electronic monitoring becomes a purely punitive measure that fails to address the reasons for the offending or to reduce the likelihood of breach due to pressures of unstable housing, substance misuse, poverty, chaotic environments and damaging relationships. I think a salutary warning uh, and again something to be addressed at stage two. I'm also keen to explore further how far we might go in using electronic mon monitoring to reduce the high numbers held in prison on remand. I recognise that including this uh, as a bail provision is not straightforward, but as the Law Society remind us, it would provide a cheaper and more efficient method of monitoring rather than imprisonment with all the disruption to work, family relationships, housing, etc. that that entails. Finally, on this aspect of the bill, I would just like to record my anxiety about what uh, uh, we've seen in terms of the massive reduction uh, in the use of home detention curfews over recent, recent months, and I, I think I would echo the concerns expressed by John Finney. The reasons for this are perhaps um, not entirely clear at this stage, but it does appear to now be the case that there is greater risk aversion within the system, while the categories of offence where HTC cannot now be considered have also undoubtedly had an effect. I understand why that is the case, but moving away from a system that allows for a managed transition of offenders back into the community carries inherent risk, both in terms of rehabilitation, but also in terms of the added pressure on staff and prisoners in an estate that we know is already in some places bursting at the seams. Various witnesses argued for keeping this under review, and I agree and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to keep the committee updated on the work uh, he has commissioned in relation to HTCs. While much of the attention at stage one uh, has focused on electronic monitoring provisions, the bill also obviously covers changes to disclosure uh, and to a limited extent parole board. Case of the uh, former, I think the approach which matches that taken south of the border is reasonable, uh, proportionate, has the potential to simplify rules around disclosure. This though will depend on the success of efforts to promote public understanding of what should be disclosed when and in what circumstances. Ultimately, though, we know that people can and do stop offending and that employment is a key factor in desistance. In the interest of public safety, therefore, by reducing the barriers to employment, we reduce the risks of re-offending. In that regard, I hope we can also see an end to the tick box used by some employers pre-interview. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are a range of issues that need addressing before this bill concludes its pa passage through Parliament. For now, however, I can confirm Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting the principles of this bill this evening. Thank you.
We'll move on now to the open debate and it's speeches of six minutes. I've got a little bit of leeway I can use to allow for interventions. And it's Rona Mackay, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, well, as we've heard, this bill's fairly complex in parts. It's hard, quite hard to distill down to six minutes, but I'll try to capture each of the three main areas of the bill's remit. Firstly, as Deputy Convener of the Justice Committee, can I add my thanks to the clerks for all their hard work producing an accurate account of the evidence we've heard over many months and to all those who gave evidence. The bill brings out a number of reforms which I believe are badly needed to ensure that Scotland's justice system retains its focus on prevention and rehabilitation while enhancing support for victims. Part one, as we've heard, uh, expands and streamlines the uses of electronic monitoring. As the policy memorandum states, the expansion of electronic monitoring supports the broader community justice policies, policies of preventing and reducing reoffending by increasing the options available to, manager and, m to manage and monitor offenders in the community and to further protect public safety, which is, of course, paramount. And I think the Cabinet Secretary stressed this more than once during his opening speech. Uh, the introduction of new technologies such as uh, Global Positioning System, GPS technology, presents opportunities to improve the effectiveness of electronic monitoring. For example, through the use of exclusion or inclusion zones that will offer victims significant reassurance. Nancy Lauk, Chief Executive of Families Outside, said, electronic monitoring offers a valuable tool for reducing the use of imprisonment. Prison fractures families, whereas with the right support in the right place, electronic monitoring can keep families together, thereby maintaining social supports and reducing the risk of further offending. However, as the convener outlined, Women's Aid have raised some concerns around GPS in regard to the safety of women and children in domestic abuse situations where the perpetrator can be seen to move freely outside the exclusion zones or to continue to use other means of contact such as texts, emails or social media. I believe this is an area that has to be carefully considered by means of constructive amendments at stage two of the bill. Presiding officer, we know that we're locking up too many people and the high use of remand accounts for Scotland being among the most punitive nations in Western Europe. There are around 8,000 prisoners in Scotland and remand prisoners make up around 19% of the prison population. Remand prisoners account for around 27% of deaths by suicide in custody. And despite efforts, most notably Dame Eilish Angelini's 2011 review, yes, Daniel Johnson. I'd wonder if my colleague would, uh, Rona McCabe would agree with me that it's shocking that the rate of uh, entry on, on the grounds of remand in Scotland is, is almost twice as high as the rest of Europe, at 18 per, I think, 100,000. That's compared to something around half that for, for most of the other OECD countries. Rona McKay. Yeah, I absolutely agree it's shocking and it's something that we seriously need to address and I hope that uh, the, the, the trajectory that we're on will, will do something to address that. Um, despite Dame Eilish Angelini's 2011 review, which reported that women in prison are likely to be victims as well as offenders, with 53% having experienced emotional, physical or sexual abuse as a child, the number of women remanded has been rising steadily over the last 40 years. 75% of those women do not go on to be convicted. This is unacceptable and in my opinion, opinion and abuse of human rights. However, ele electronic monitoring on remand is not currently included in the bill, but the committee heard persuasive evidence that it, it should be. So I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's comments on that in his closing speech. I'm aware that the government is proposing to introduce a pilot project to test its use and I appreciate some information on that too. Presiding officer, the expansion of electronic monitoring is part of the Scottish Government's continued development of community-based alternatives to prison. Scotland's communities have benefited from, around, benefited from around 7 million hours of unpaid work by people serving community payback orders since their introduction in 2011. From gritting roads in cold weather, refurbishing and redecorating uh, local facilities, they've paid dividends to both the offender and the community. Furthermore, reconviction rates for those released from a short prison sentence are almost double to that to those in payback orders. Strong evidence that the government's plan to lay the order to extend the presumption against short prison sentences from three to 12 months is justified. Yes. Liam Kerr. But isn't the member concerned, though, that this expansion to CPOs would come at a time when 
uh, I think one in three is never completed. Rona McKay. It's, it, it's, it isn't as, as, as high as that, but it, it's, it's, uh, it, it is not a reason not to, to go down this road because it's, it's not a reason to go down and that, that would be a separate issue that we would have to deal with. Uh, it's, it, but it's not as extreme as, as you're saying. Um, presenting officer, as we've heard, the Cabinet Secretary has indicated he's considering the introduction of a new offensive unlawfully at large following the tragic murder in 2017 of Craig McClelland. Um, the government approved all recommendations in the subsequent two reports, which has resulted in a drop of HDC releases of almost 75% from around 20 to 30 a week to around seven, uh, as John Finney was, was highlighting. And the committee, committee is calling for an early review um, on whether we've got the right balance. But it was interesting to hear the Cabinet Secretary's remarks in his opening statement on this. Uh, for me, presiding officer, and for the committee, risk assessment is crucial in the use of electronic monitoring. And this must be the top priority. Public safety is always paramount. Tackling breaches must also be addressed and wider poli police powers of arrest may be necessary, which I'm sure will be considered at stage two. It has to be recognized that uh, managing offenders by electronic monitoring or to successfully rehabilitate offenders must be backed up with resources to support them. And I agree entirely with Don Daniel Johnson's comments uh, on this. Uh, the many fantastic organi organizations who do need uh, who do this need financial security if the new uh, approach is to be successful. Part two of the bill relates to disclosure of convictions and it's, as we've heard it's the case that anyone with a previous conviction can be disadvantaged for the rest of their lives uh, when they've completed their sentence. One particular concern raised by NACRO uh, and other organisations was the tick box practice where someone has to disclose a previous conviction at the initial application stage. Uh, NACRO stated convictions should not in themselves rule people out of employment and people should have a fair assessment without being automatically disbarred at the first stage. If you and could a, draw to a conclusion, please. A committee uh, visit to the WISE group confirmed this uh, view powerfully. But I just need to highlight again that on the disclosure uh, with regard to domestic abuse where reoffending is particularly high, Scottish Women's Aid said there must be a balance between the resettlement of offenders and the protection of the public. I haven't got time to go into the, must the parole, conclude, but please. So in conclusion, uh, this bill is part of the SNP's government's wider work to reform the, the, the justice system, provide public safety and support victims. And I ask the Chamber to support those general principles. Maurice Corey, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would first of all like to thank all those who have worked so hard to bring this bill to this stage one uh, today. I visited prisons and I've met defenders of all sorts, some in prison for a few months and others with life sentences. These offenders have families, aspirations, and potential, just like the rest of us. And whilst having a responsibility for these offenders' rehabilitation, we have an equal responsibility to the victims of these crimes. Though the Bill on Management of Offenders has changes for helping to reintegrate prisoners, it does not focus on victim safety as much as it should. We cannot overlook the safety of victims in moving forward with this bill. As spokesman and spokesperson for the community safety for the Scottish Conservatives and a member of our justice team, I have committed to keeping communities safe and I've seen firsthand the importance of security on a national and community level. In line with safety, the bill's three main elements, improving electronic monitoring, shortening disclosure times and streamlining the patrol board, should use risk assessment judiciously. I acknowledge the research which has gone into the bill but further examination is needed to ensure that the bill does enough to improve the management of offenders and for the protection of our communities. Part one of... Yes, I give way. Hamza Youssef. I thank Maurice Corey, and I will listen, of course, to, to the rest of his speech. I just wonder, can he give an indication of what amendments exactly that either he will bring forward or he wants the government to bring forward to give uh, more weight to, to, to victim safety and all of this? Because it would be quite helpful at this stage if I was able to get specifics on that and come back at stage two. Maurice Corey. Yeah. I think basically um, we should make sure that the, we give more, more obviously, um, power to the police to make sure that when they are investigating crime and when obviously they're protecting our communities, that they are, they are on the ball with, with, with that. And obviously that the appropriate um, um, procedure is put in place to, to make sure that the perpetrators of the crime actually um, adhe are, are adhered to. And in fact, as far as we're concerned, is that the... Um, 
that we make sure that if we put in electronic monitoring, it is properly sorted, and we must stop and reduce the amount that break that, you know, cut the, 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 the band off, the leg, or whatever it is, okay? So uh, I think it's about managing the, uh, managing the, 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 the issue uh, and, and being sensible about it. Um, part one of the bill, uh, as I say, outlines the changes for electronic monitoring. I support the bill in its, in its step towards improving electronic monitoring capabilities, but not expanding its use. And since electronic monitoring's introduction, technology has significantly changed using the GPS system seems like a logical step in improving electronic monitoring. An electronic monitoring in Scotland Working Group report claims that increasing the number of individuals released on license with electronic monitoring presents a unique opportunity to aid prisoner reintegration whilst maintaining an element of control. <coughs> but again, we must be cautious, as I said to the Cabinet Secretary already, is about putting that and managing that system in. <coughs> but it is obvious in the wake of cases like the Craig McClellan case that improvements are necessary in securing the safety of our citizens so horrendous and preventable crimes such as this don't happen again. And I stand by the 2016 Conservative Manifesto that life should mean life for some of the worst offenders who would not have the right to reply, apply for parole. We must ensure that everything is done in wisdom and order and we cannot overlook the victims of these offenders. Using exclusion and inclusion zones through GPS monitoring can offer victims a greater safety reassurance, but it is still not enough. <coughs> As I mentioned before, this is a twofold issue. We must, continue, we must keep communities safe and rehabilitate the offenders. By this logic, many argue that community sentences are the best way forward for the prisoner, but justice cannot be denied. As one third of the community sentences are not completed, surely it is questionable to expand their use. Victim Support Scotland notes, and I quote, that communities have no faith in community sentencing, and close quotes. This is not fair to victims, nor is it just that offenders evade what is both a punishment and a rehabilitation. Now I'll touch briefly on disclosures. It is staggering that 33% of males and 10% of females in Scotland are likely to have a criminal conviction. This does not mean that these people are hard, all hardened criminals. Much to the contrary, these people have to disclose their sentences to employers, colleges, armed forces, universities, and the like. And according to the timetable set in place in the 1974 Disclosures Act, the world has a, is a changed place since 1974, but much remains the same. Though we might not think, like to think so, employers could discriminate against someone with a criminal record when hiring them, and having to disclose spent, save, spent sentences for long periods of time can have an ongoing impact on career opportunities, education, opening a bank account, for example. This makes it difficult for those wanting to move on from the past offences to do so. Their crime was committed, a punishment was served, now that their time has been spent. It is not only compassionate, but just that reformed offenders should be allowed to move on from their past offences. Justice is an ongoing process, and I agree, it is only fair that past offenders who could benefit from this men actually do. But to protect public safety, it's only correct that offences more serious in nature are disclosed in disclosure and barring checks. And as for the parole board, it's only right that we see, that they up, that is, that we see an update in its form and regulation. And the parole, bo the parole board uh, serves as an important role in in essential in, and is essential in managing the community risk of the offenders. Though, uh, through, uh, sorry, though separate from the bill, the Conservatives pressed the government on this issue in December last year. And as a result, the, go the government planned to consult on the openness, um, transparency and victim involvement of the parole board. And I've personally met with members of the parole board and have seen the good work that they do. It is not an easy task to decide an offender's future and the bill contains provision to improve their operations. And Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, uh, through improving electronic monitoring, reducing disclosure times and streamlining the parole board, the Management Offenders Bill could take a step in the right direction for a safer Scotland. But this is not enough, frankly. This bill seeks to reform offenders while overlooking the needs of victims. As this bill progresses, I, welcome, I would welcome amendments which hold community safety and victim safety at the forefront, and I trust the Cabinet Secretary will take action on these amendments. Thank you. Fulton McGregor, followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Um, and uh, it was a, a pleasure to be on the Justice Committee uh, for at least the second uh, round of uh, evidence gathering for this bill. I wasn't on the, the, the committee at the time when evidence was, was first called for. 
Uh, and like others have said, I'd like to put on record my thanks to the, the clerks. I think, um, President Officer, you'll know that we had another debate in the Chamber earlier uh, in the week on the, the Vulnerable Witnesses Scotland Bill, and I think it's credit to the clerking team to prepare two highly quality reports uh, in the timescales that, that have been mentioned and uh, as a very busy committee. The bill, uh, also as others have said, allows for GPS to be used, preventing and reducing reoffending by managing people in the community and reducing time in prison. And this, this is, of course, in line with the wider ideological uh, issues for justice in Scotland. And we know that, in general, rehabilitation uh, is much more likely to be successful in the community. And the uh, restriction of liberty orders um, as a form of uh, electronic monitoring have been used since... Yeah? Aye. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank my colleague for, for giving way on this point. And, and while I agree with the sentiment about the use of electronic tagging and reintegration, would he acknowledge uh, the, the new inspector of prisons uh, comments that we don't actually have the data on the effectiveness of these things? And that is a, a, a deficiency as it stands. Milton McGregor. I thank the member for that intervention. I'm just going on to talk about a uh, restriction of liberty orders now, but I do, I do recognise the, 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 the lack of data as an issue. Um, restriction of liberty orders, as I was saying, have been used from about 2002, and, and in my opinion, are quite effective. Um, the you know, compliance does seem to be quite high with them. I take uh, Daniel Johnson's point, though, that uh, you know, we maybe need a wee bit more data around that, but they are quite widely used by uh, courts as an alternative to custody. But I think the key thing that they do is that they allow uh, people to continue other work they're doing, perhaps through a community payback order, allowing them to address their offending behaviour rather than uh, going into uh, uh, to custody. Uh, and it also uh, allows them to maintain employment, if they've got employment, and maintain positive relationships, two of the key factors that we know are crucial to reducing reoffending. Um, Presiding officer, as others have mentioned, we know that the evidence uh, uh, gathering was extended um, between November and January, um, and that was due to the, well, prompted by the, the tragic case of uh, Craig McClellan. I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has now proposed that risk assessment uh, process should be strengthened to make decision-making procedures uh, you know, regarding home detention curfews. And I know also that um, the Cabinet Secretary's statement that there will now be a presumption that individuals whose index offence involves violence or knife crime will not, in normal circumstances, receive home detention curfew, and uh, also an intention to extend this to serious and organised crime. The, the committee was a wee bit... Um, uh, unsure over where, because uh, that's obviously the index offence for which somebody's serving uh, a sentence, but we weren't sure if there was, if there was past uh, uh, offences that, that maybe come under those categories, where that would fit in, and I suppose that's why the assessment process uh, is absolutely crucial. Uh, we heard from James maybe from Social Work Scotland, who was pretty clear that electronic monitoring is not a panacea, and I think that, that everybody in the committee agreed with that. It, it isn't for every, every single case. And we need to take into account the, 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 wider, uh, the wider impacts, particularly maybe if somebody's on a, a community payback order. And I will just, um, talking about community payback orders here, but mention Liam Kerr's uh, intervention on my colleague Rona Mackay. Uh, the, the stats were out this week for 2017, 2018. 70% of community payback orders are complete, which is roughly what, what you're saying, 30% uncomplete. But, I think that you know, you've got to look at the, a wide range of circumstances why that might not be the case, eh, as opposed to it being a failure of the system. 70% is, is, is probably quite a good eh, mark. Um, have I got time, President Officer? That's up to you, Mr McGregor. I'm, I'm going to have to leave. I've already taken one. Apologies. I know I mentioned you, so I apologise. Risk assessment, um, in my view, needs to take into account the whole circumstances and have access to the relevant information uh, for other areas. And I know we've talked here about that, you know, that um, there was evidence here that, that, that social work reports would, uh, would often just, you know, um, only hear what the, what the individual had to say. I, I, don't, um, I don't think that would be very often the case, certainly not in my experience, but I do, I do accept that often more weight, more weight the, the majority of the information for a report uh, is given to the, the individual interview. Um, I think that the, one of the things that we looked at um, a lot was the risk to others. You know, if somebody's uh, placed on a, 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 an electronic monitoring device, they might be placed at home. What, what, what sort of uh, risk do they pose to others? There could be children in the house, that, uh, child protection situations. There could be um, a domestic abuse element, which I know that, that, that colleagues are going to speak about. Uh, and, and the very nature of domestic abuse, it might not be detected. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, uh, 
uh, an individual uh, who who's perpetrating domestic abuse against his partner is, is, then, is then in the house. I think we need to look at that. Uh, I do see that I'm, I'm running out of time, presiding officer, but tackling breaches was something that um, we took a lot of evidence on. Uh, and I think that the creation of a new offence, I welcome that. I, think I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening statement. I hear what the other parties are saying as well, but I think we've got to, we've got to reach some sort of compromise on that. Um, where breaches uh, happen, where there's an alcohol and drug uh, issue present, I think we really need to uh, be mindful of that. We, in this country, we do uh, treat addiction as a, as a health concern, uh, more than a, than a justice concern, so we really need to, to look at that as well. And, and you know, I had a couple of things to say about the parole board as well, uh, presiding officer, but I, I do see that I'm out of time, so I'd simply end by urging the, uh, the, the whole chamber uh, to back the principles of the bill at stage one. Thank you very much. Neil Bibby, followed by Shona Robson. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Justice Committee members for preparing their report. The Bill is an important piece of legislation, important not just because it provides for modernisation and reform of how offenders are managed, but because it is an opportunity to strengthen the law too, particularly the law in relation to electronic monitoring and home detention curfews, which I want to focus on this afternoon. And it's an opportunity that must not be missed. There have been clear gaps in the law and gaps in the system which must be addressed. As has been said, the committee supports in principle the introduction of a new offence of being unlawfully at large when a HDC is breached, as do I. On the question of resources, it's clear that the electronic monitoring alone is not sufficient and it must be provided alongside other forms of monitoring and intervention. The committee have quite rightly called for greater clarity on the additional resources that will be made available to the Risk Management Authority, local authorities and others to make a new approach work. The committee have also stated it is not immediately obvious where the extra resources will come from. In addition, like Daniel Johnson and others, I would also suggest there are a number of areas where the Scottish Government could go further. Enhanced public reporting of the use of home detention curfews and independent monitoring. Avoiding jurisdictional issues by requiring that to be eligible for HDC and address in Scotland that has been properly assessed must be provided. Crucially, we must ensure that there is always thorough risk assessment of HDCs. Serious consideration should be given to how those risk assessments could be made independently as opposed to being conducted only by overstretched and under pressure prison service staff. The bill has to deliver a far better system of managing offenders in practice. Yes, I think John Finney. Um, thank you, Senator. Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would the member not acknowledge that there is a role at present for criminal justice social work in the compilation of these risk assessments? Neil Bibby. I acknowledge that. I think we just need to look, look further about how, how, how we can strengthen that, that process and, and make it more independently, and, and, as I've said. Um, the bill has to deliver a far better system of managing offenders in practice. Um, as members have said, it is also must deliver a system that carries the confidence of the public victims and law-abiding families like the family of Craig McClelland. My community was shocked by Craig's tragic murder. A family man going about his own business one evening in Paisley killed in an unprovoked attack. Killed by a man previously convicted of knife offences who had been unlawfully at large for five months, having broken his tag. One of the most important duties of any government, the police and the prison service, is to keep the public safe. The policy memorandum makes perfectly the need to balance the provisions in part one of the bill against the need to further protect public safety. In the McClellan case, that duty was failed with tragic circumstances. Now there are three children who will grow up without their father. The committee report on HDC sentences states that the public has the right to be protected as far as possible against the risk that someone will reoffend. That simply did not happen in this case. No member of my community or any other should ever have to have been failed in the way Craig McClellan was. No family should have to go through what Craig's have. And no family should have to fight like they have just to get some answers. To understand not just what happened to Craig, but most importantly, why it happened. Two process reviews by HMIPS and HMICS have confirmed there have been significant failings leading up to Craig's death, but only said so much. The family have been left with more questions than answers. They know something has gone terribly wrong, but what went wrong and why they came to pass has never, to their mind, been fully and properly detailed, explained and exposed. And what answers they have been able to get, they simply cannot trust. Such has been the loss of confidence in the system 
they should be able to turn to in times like this. To ensure that lessons are learned so that no other family has to go through what they did. Close family uh, members of the McClellan family called for a full independent inquiry. An inquiry very clearly in the public interest and hugely relevant to debate we are having today about the future of electronic monitoring. The Chamber will be aware that the Justice Secretary is resisting a public inquiry into the circumstances leading to the murder of Craig McClelland. Uh, like many others, I believe uh, that refusal is without good reason. But families should have a right to answers and shouldn't have to plead to ministers for action and a full inquiry. It should be automatic. Craig's father, Michael, has now written to the Lord Advocate asking him to instruct a fatal accident inquiry, and I welcome the support for that from members across the chamber. I hope the Lord Advocate will agree and give the case full and sympathetic consideration. But the battle the family are going through for an inquiry just serves to illustrate another weakness in legislation. If a prisoner in a custodial setting were to murder another, then there is no question there would be a fatal accident inquiry. Any death in prison custody could lead to a fatal accident inquiry under the 2016 Act. If that's the case for deaths on the prison estate, why do we not apply similar standards to deaths caused by prisoners serving their sentence or part of their sentence on an HDC? President officer, I'm prepared to bring forward amendments to the bill at stage two to that effect. I will seek to amend this bill to ensure that inquiries would be mandatory in tragic cases like the Craig McClellan murder. How can we be confident in the solutions brought forward to make HDCs work right if we don't fully learn the lessons when they have gone so wrong? Families have been let down so awfully need to have confidence in the system and confidence in this bill. This bill might plug gaps and fix some of the weaknesses in the electronic monitoring and HDCs, but will it fundamentally strengthen the way we manage offenders and improve public safety? We cannot have confidence in the system until we know for sure that lessons have fully been learned. Thank you. Shona Robinson, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, to have a, a truly fair and progressive criminal justice system for Scotland, it's fundamentally important that we get our management of offenders right. The bill has the potential to transform Scotland's approach to criminal justice. It focuses on the prevention and rehabilitation of offenders, as well as enhancing uh, support for victims. The bill also furthers the Scottish Government's ambition to reform Scotland's justice system to a more progressive model. Uh, the government has already demonstrated this approach through a number of initiatives. It has uh, established clear, clear guidance on the, the rights of victims of crime under the Victims Code for Scotland. It's developing community custody units to rehabilitate women offenders nearing the end of their sentences, helping them transition back into society. And just this week, it's taken forward legislation to protect vulnerable witnesses, particularly child witnesses, in a bill that I'm pleased to say was backed uh, unanimously by this uh, Parliament on Tuesday. The Management of Offenders Bill uh, furthers this uh, approach. It's an approach which is built on evidence, compassion and, uh, of course, justice. I've spoken before in uh, this chamber on the importance of electronic monitoring as a, an alternative uh, to remand sentencing, so I'm pleased uh, to see that part one of the bill expands on this. Expanding the use of electronic monitoring has the potential to prevent and reduce reoffending in Scotland, although I do think a point about the data collection that's been made is a valid one and one that needs to be uh, pursued. Electronic monitoring does offer a, a community-based alternative to, uh, to prison sentencing, an alternative which is consistent with our uh, presumption against short-term sentencing. We know that short-term prison sentencing has a potential to significantly disrupt families and impact on, for example, housing security. We also know that offenders held in custody for 12 months or less are nearly twice as likely to re-offend compared to those given community-based uh, alternatives. Electronic monitoring is a, an opportunity to manage and monitor offenders effectively, while, though importantly, protecting and ensuring public safety. And I certainly acknowledge the comments that have been made, uh, particularly, I think we're all particularly mindful of the, the tragic case of Craig McClellan. Um, and public safety has to be uh, at the core and has to be uh, the, the overriding priority here. But I do believe 
that it is, that is uh, possible uh, with some of the reforms um, in this bill uh, to, to achieve that and to minimise risk. The implementation of GPS technology uh, also offers the potential to improve the effectiveness of electronic monitoring through the use of exclusion or inclusion zones. And the benefits of this are obvious, but of course it should only ever be used where appropriate. And to that end, I'm pleased that the bill also provides guidance on the appropriate use of this technology and that risk assessments uh, must be uh, made. It follows that Scotland uh, should follow the, the evidence and pursue a results-based uh, approach. I believe that the bill does that. I also note that there are reforms that this bill makes to dis disclosure of criminal convictions. It's important to note, however, that this bill does not impact upon higher level uh, disclosures nor proposes abolishing the need for a disclosure process altogether. What the bill does do is support the ambition of reintegrating and rehabilitating uh, previous offenders as well as recognising the stigma that is often attached to previous uh, convictions. This ambition was supported by a majority of the evidence given to the Justice Committee and the proposals in the bill have been developed through consultation and dialogue with stakeholders. Uh, criminal record disclosure can be a significant barrier when trying to secure employment. Job applicants can face stigma and discrimination, making it much harder to reintegrate, uh, reintegrate into society. So if we truly desire our criminal justice system to be uh, rehabilitative, and believe in the principle of opportunities for reintegration into the workforce when we have to ensure that we address this. A balanced approach is required, and I believe this bill helps us uh, achieve a, a more balanced approach. The bill deals with a number of other reforms, most notably in relation to the functions and structure of the parole board for Scotland uh, by delivering on some of the aims of the parole uh, reform uh, programme. It's important, however, to stress that the parole board will continue to act independently uh, and that's important. These reforms will simp simplify and modernise the parole board's processes, as well as ensuring greater consistency in the application of parole uh, decisions. The commitment to strengthen the voice of victims and their families in both parole and temporary release is to be welcomed, and this supports the principle that victim must, victims must be heard and listened to. I note in the programme for government that it includes a, a, a commitment to increase the transparency of Scotland's parole system and that it will be consulting on proposals to do this later this year. I look forward to hearing more with regards to these proposals from the Justice Secretary in due course. As I said at the start of my speech, the way in which we treat offenders in Scotland will define our criminal justice system. Uh, it must be fair and just, not just to offenders though, but also to their victims. And to that end, I'm pleased that the Programme for Government also commits to a number of reforms to support the victims of crime particularly in partnership with Victim Support Scotland. This builds upon the work of the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014, the Victims Code for Scotland, and the £18 million that the Scottish Government spends each year to support the victims of crime through agencies such as Victim Support Scotland. This uh, is a, the balanced approach which we seek for Scotland's justice system. Um, we all share a belief that the system should aspire to be fair uh, for everyone, for, for victims and for uh, offenders where possible. This bill represents another step in the Scottish Government's work to transform and continually improve the criminal justice system. And as a member of the Justice Committee, I welcome it. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. <clears throat> I don't have the pleasure of uh, sitting um, on the committee that um, has done all the hard work. And so when I came to uh, read the Stage 1 report, um, I came with it perhaps with some... Uh, fresh eyes um, and was uh, very interested uh, in what had been uh, proposed and the evidence that was taken by the committee. And can I congratulate the convener and her committee for a very full report, which I think fleshes out uh, a lot of the ideas and concepts uh, behind the bill. Um, as previous speakers um, have spoken, um, we will be supporting the stage one uh, today, but I think that does come with a number of caveats and I do think at stage two and stage three uh, the government still have some work to do. Uh, the slight danger of uh, coming um, at this stage in any debate is that um, a lot of issues have already been uh, fleshed out uh, by people with more expertise uh, than me 
Uh, but uh, hopefully in the next few moments, I can concentrate particularly on the elect electronic monitoring system. Uh, as I say, I, I welcome the new, new technology that is out there. I am still slightly concerned and was interested to read that uh, the police monitor it not in real time. So if someone breaks the curfew or goes out even with um, a tag on, the police are not aware of that until after the event has occurred. John Finney, please. Thank, thank you, President. I'm, I'm grateful to the member taking the information. Would the member accept that actually it's not the police that's monitoring, it's a private commercial company? Well, I, I, yeah, I accept that the private company do it on behalf of, of, of the state. But I think the point is, it's not happening in real time. And I do think with the change in technology and the way that technology is working, I would ask the Scottish Government to look again to see whether that is possible. I, I think victims, uh, particularly uh, vulnerable uh, victims, uh, would be much more happy to know that if an, a reoffence was going to occur, the agency or the police uh, knew about that and could intervene earlier. I, I, again, I, I'll just make a bit of progress and maybe come back if that's okay. Uh, the second issue, and again, as someone who's not involved heavily in this area, and as I read the report, I was surprised um, that the government hadn't moved, that um, the cutting of a tag would not be an automatic offence. Um, I, I, I do think uh, the overwhelming majority of the public would expect that to occur. Now, I know the Minister has made comments in his opening speech about that. Um, I would urge him and the government to look again at that. For me, there does need to simply be a, a blanket offence, that the appropriate punishment happens if you break uh, the offence by cutting your tag. Uh, the same would be true in regard to bail conditions. Uh, uh, and for me to say that some uh, offences are different from others um, does concern me. And so um, I welcome what the Minister has said in his opening speech, uh, but I would maybe push him to go further in regard to that. If I could move on to the issue um, around bail, um, Many years ago, I spent a, a whole year uh, instructing um, advocates to do bail appeals um, up in the uh, High Court in Edinburgh. And, and, and bail appeals were interesting to me because uh, it never seemed to be completely logical who would get bail um, and who wouldn't. However, I, I was again interested to read that uh, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, predecessor in, in when he gave evidence to the committee around electronic monitoring um, and bail didn't think that this was an appropriate way to go. I understand from the report that the study was done about 12 years ago uh, and that study didn't seem to give enough evidence to show that um, there would be an appropriate way for bail. Clearly things have moved on in 12 years um, and again I would be interested to know whether the Cabinet Secretary uh, would look at a, a fresh a pilot scheme to see whether this is an appropriate way uh, for electric tagging to take place. I mean, I do think victims, particularly those who um, have been uh, maybe assaulted or, or, or face a fairly serious crime, again, to know that somebody was being tagged um, and could be monitored would give them the reassurances uh, that they want. Deputy President, Officer, as I uh, draw my remarks to a conclusion, again, if I can just... Uh, welcome some of the reforms around the parole body. Um, I agree absolutely uh, with Shona Robson that we need to keep the parole body independent um, and it, it mustn't be uh, interfered for uh, by uh, politicians. But I do think, and, I, and again, I appreciate the, the Cabinet Secretary had made comments in this in his opening speech, but I do think there needs to be more say to victims and families. Now, I recognise previous comments that there is already that within the system but I do know um, many uh, victims who feel isolated uh, when it comes to the parole board. And I also think, uh, keeping that independence, which I, I've said I totally um, welcome, I do think there needs to be a bit more accountability on how the parole board reach their decisions and why they come to those decisions. 
That doesn't mean that we should be jumping up at FMQs every time questioning the parole board's decision. But I do think, particularly for families and for the uh, victims of crime, to have that accountability in a more public way would be beneficial. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Bob Doris, followed by Mary Fee. Mr Doris, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, I wish to speak in this afternoon's debate in part in relation to, as to what is not in the bill as to much as what is actually in it, and I'll return to that matter later. My comments this afternoon will be in particular reference to the work of the Parole Board. There are elements of the reform in part three of the bill regarding the Parole Board. I know and I agree with the committee on their description of these as limited. For instance, the bill removes the requirement to have a High Court judge or a psychiatrist sitting on it. I also note that the committee is said to be broadly supportive of these reforms more generally. However, as he has acknowledged, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged, these reforms must be seen in conjunction with uh, a consultation and reforms the Pro Board launched uh, in December the 19th last year. I also agree with the committee, with the committee that it is unfortunate that these proposals are not be considered in the round with what emerges from that wider consultation. That, of course, is not a reason to reject the proposals contained within the bill, but it does remain unfortunate. We must remember that the principal role of the parole board relates to the possible release of a prisoner once that part of the sentence which relates to punishment and deterrence has been served in custody. However, crucially, the parole board is charged with assessing whether the level and nature of any risk a prisoner still presents at that point can be safely managed within the community. That is crucial, of course, as it sets the rights of the prisoner being considered for release alongside the rights of wider communities that we serve and society in general. The Scottish Government's programme for government states that it will ensure victims and their families have better information and greater support ahead of prison release arrangements. Given the tragic stories of families we've heard about here this afternoon, not least of all the tragic murder of Craig McClellan from Paisley, if we don't get the provisions in part one of the bill right, then of course we risk creating a whole new set of victims. But I strongly believe the opportunity exists to have a more safe and to have a more safe community disposal and reduce reoffending by using this bill wisely. I absolutely believe that is what the outcome can be. In that context, however, I would wish to repeat the committee recommendation in part one that ele electric monitoring should only be used after a comprehensive assessment of risk, particularly for those individuals who would otherwise be incarcerated. I will make no comment of the robustness or review of any comprehensive risk assessment, but rather thank the committee who have looked at these matters in some detail for the work that they are doing. However, there has to be strong public confidence in such risk assessments, whilst we must also acknowledge what Margaret Mitchell, convener of the committee, said in a very thoughtful speech from John Finney, MSP, that risk is never fully limited. But we don't lock people up and throw away the key. We don't do that as a society. I would, however, put on record my support uh, for opportunities that technology allows us with electronic monitoring and, of course, I will also follow closely, because it came up earlier in the debate, the Scottish Government's consideration of the specific concern, offence of unlawfully at large. Regarding part three of the bill, once more, as I said at the start of my speech, uh, this is as much to do with what is not in the bill as what is in the bill. In relation to the ongoing consultation regarding the parole board and the role of victims, we need to ensure the commitment to better info information referred to and the very welcome enhanced openness and transparency that the Scottish Government wishes for victims and families is meaningful, is interactive, involves a dialogue and is more than a tick box exercise. In that regard, I commend the committee conclusion to ask the Parole Board to consider the wider impact of their decisions, particularly on victims and how victims can be given a voice in the process. The committee also notes that this will be a key part of the consultation. I would like to go further than that though. I would ask that the Scottish Government give consideration in certain circumstances to how witnesses can also be included within that process. Let me explain. Imagine you are a key witness, a crucial witness in a most serious criminal trial. Your evidence has been instrumental in securing a sound conviction. Your identity is known to the perpetrator 
perhaps you knew the perpetrator. That person may be released from prison under certain parole conditions. Wouldn't that witness wish to be notified of impending release? Wouldn't that witness like to seek support and reassurances? Wouldn't they also want that information and transparency? So we'd ask the Scottish Government to give that serious and significant consideration and take this contribution as part of that wider consultation that's actually ongoing. Finally, presiding officer, can I commend the Scottish Government that is establishing a support service with Victim Support Scotland to give uh, families bereaved by murder and culpable homicide dedicated and continued support. I understand that this will also be open to those bereaved by such acts overseas, and I welcome this, a matter that I am particularly interested in. I've enjoyed listening to this debate more than I have contributing to it, because I haven't sat on the committee and I don't have that granular knowledge of the issues raised, but I wanted to raise one specific issue, Cabinet Secretary, in relation to the role of witnesses as well as victims. And in that spirit, I'm happy to, and I certainly hope the Parliament will agree the general principles of the bill before us here this afternoon. Thank you, Mr Doris. I call Mary Fee to be followed by Jenny Gilruth, and Ms Fee is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin my remarks today by supporting the points that were made by my colleague Neil Bibby on the tragic case of Craig McClelland? And I also welcome the comments made by other members across the, the, the chamber showing their support for Craig McClelland's family. The family of Mr McClelland deserve answers, and the debate today should serve as a reminder to us all that the management and monitoring of offenders is important to protect the public and support rehabilitation for those who need it and for those who deserve it. It's also a reminder that the management of offenders can impact on more than just the offender. And I do welcome the general principles of the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. And I want to thank the Justice Committee for a very informative and a very thorough stage one report. The contributions from those in the criminal justice sector and from third sector groups have given us a greater insight into the needs of this bill, whilst also detailing how we can improve the support for offenders, for their families and for the community as a whole. And the changes proposed in this bill to electronic monitoring have widespread support, but they can go further. And even if they remain as they have been set out, resourcing any changes must be effectively and efficiently funded. And the Justice Committee recognises that electronic monitoring will only be effective if delivered in conjunction with the right support from other agencies. And this was raised by a number of witnesses during the committee's evidence sessions. And James Maybe from Highland Council and Social Work Scotland said the bill would be a failed opportunity if it ended up resulting in increased workloads for social workers and that working with criminal justice, social work and third sector has to be an integral part of electronic monitoring if the future, in the future if we are to maximise its potential success. And Families Outside also warned that without structured supports in place, electronic monitoring becomes a purely punitive measure. And it was a point that was very well made by Liam MacArthur in, in his comment. And Families Outside went on to say that if, if it failed to address the reasons for the offending or to reduce the likelihood of the breach due to pressures of unstable housing, substance misuse, poverty, chaotic environments and damaging relationships. And presiding officer, that quote from Families Outside also reveals the importance of having support for the family of an offender on electronic monitoring. And that, that's a subject that, that I have often spoken about in, in debates in, in this chamber, the need to support the families of, of offenders. And the evidence of the committee shows that families can struggle to deal with the demands of living with someone on a home detention curfew or an electronic monitoring. Karen McCluskey of Community Justice Scotland best described this by saying, home detention curfew is a big ask for lots of families. Having someone in the house from seven in the morning until seven at night might be quite difficult for some families. We know that families can support people to comply with their order, but it takes a great toll on them. Tensions can grow at home, between partners, between parents, and between children. 
and anyone living in the home. That can happen within any home. However, curfew and monitoring can exacerbate problems at home. And children must be protected when facing such challenges and such massive change. It can be daunting for a child to have strangers in their house, adding new technology in the home, and seeing their parent wearing a tag around their ankle. Problems associated with alcohol or drug misuse won't disappear with collecting data or use on use of cons or consumption. It would be dangerous, as highlighted by the Edinburgh Bar Association, to expect complete abstinence from alcohol. And, and on the link between alcohol and domestic abuse, Scottish Women's Aid warned the committee not to assume that preventing offenders from drinking in cases of domestic abuse will prevent them from offending. Of course, many will find themselves in the criminal justice system because of alcohol or drugs. However, they need proper treatment and they need counselling to overcome their problems. And to ensure that police have the ability to protect communities, we must ensure they are properly empowered to do this. We cannot have more tragic losses like that of Craig McClelland. They are entirely preventable and with the right resources and the right powers to allow the police to carry out their duties. And finally, presiding officer, at the heart of this debate is a need to recognise the necessity for a wraparound system of community justice. One that starts at the point of sentencing, right through to release and re-entering the community. And this is clear from the evidence that was presented to the committee in both the written submissions and during the committee's questioning sessions. And again, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is an issue that I have raised many times in debates in this chamber. And it is clear that this bill does need to be strengthened. And I do hope that as this bill progresses, we see more recognition of the impact on families and an acknowledgement that support is required. I do, like my co colleagues, welcome the general principles of the bill. And I hope that the government will listen to and take heed of the external bodies who contributed to this stage one report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fee. I call Jenny Gilruth, then we move to closing speeches. Ms. Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking the clerks to the Parliament's Justice Committee uh, for the second time this week for all their work in supporting and pulling together the committee's uh, report ahead of this stage one debate. Uh, and I'm glad that we will all be voting this evening to support the principles uh, of the bill. When I was still at school in 2001, Scotland's prison population stood at 5,803 people. And by the year 2015, it had gone up to 7,647. That's an increase of more than a third. Just two days ago in the chamber, members heard evidence uh, from Children First who described Scotland's approach to criminal justice as rooted in the Victorian era. So today's legislation is therefore a timely intervention in the management of offenders, particularly if we consider that recorded crime rates in Scotland remain at a record low level. As has already been mentioned, today's bill has three overarching policy intentions. First of all, to extend the use of electronic tagging, uh, monitoring rather, to reduce the time taken for disclosure of convictions, for example, when applying for a new job, and to reform the functions and governance of the Parole Board for Scotland. And the wider policy context for the Scottish Government is one that is set in the parameters of community justice and of preventing and reducing re-offending. That can only be achieved by increasing the options available to manage and monitor offenders. And as Rona Mackay quoted earlier, and I'm going to quote again from families outside, they told the committee quite powerfully, I thought, that electronic monitoring offers a valuable tool for reducing the use of imprisonment. Prison fractures families, whereas the right support in place, electronic monitoring, can help to keep families together, thereby maintaining social supports and reducing the risk of further reoffending. And that was something that Mary Fee alluded to in her comments uh, just prior to my contribution. Indeed, in gender uh, emphasise the differing impact of imprisonment on men and women, particularly with reference to traditional family roles, pointing to the prison rate for women in Scotland remaining one of the highest in Northern Europe. As the Electronic Monitoring Working Group recommended in October 2016, GPS technology is versatile and decisions on its use should be made as part of an individually tailored approach, including where it can aid public and victim safety and where it can be used supportively to strengthen the monitored person's desistance. 
As the convener alluded to in her contribution earlier, that balance between public protection and the potential benefits of releasing someone with the use of electronic monitoring as an alternative to custody was something that the committee considered in great detail. And as Scottish Women's Aid told the committee, there must be a balance between the resettlement of offenders and the protection of the public. The legislation will allow for the use of GPS technology to monitor offenders' movement and it will also provide for the enforcement of e exclusion zones around victims' homes, for example. That can both offer both reassurance and um, respite to victims, as the Cabinet Secretary alluded to in his opening remarks. And on this point, a number of gendered implications for the use of electronic monitoring more broadly were highlighted to the committee with Scottish Women's Aid pointing out that where the monitoring was used pre-trial, identified that victims would be made potentially anxious by seeing the abuser uh, moving freely around in settings outside the exclusion zone, and studies have indicated that they were concerned that abusers would be able to manipulate that technology or subvert its capabilities and undermine programme rules and restrictions. And I do appreciate, I have previously raised this point with the Cabinet Secretary at committee, but I'd be grateful if you could revisit the gendered implications of widening the use of GPS technology and domestic abuse cases particularly uh, when summing up later. Indeed, as enshrined by the legislation passed by this Parliament, domestic abuse is now acknowledged as encompassing coercive and controlling behaviour, which is far more difficult to police via GPS technology, for example. Uh, Glasgow City's Health and Social Care Partnership also noted that some victims have reported over time being re-traumatised by the presence of electronic monitoring box uh, within their own homes. So this provision very much requires the cooperation of victims. With more routine electronic monitoring involving a curfew, there is potential, for example, that the victim goes to home, the home of the perpetrator as they are confined to that address. Again, potentially increasing the risk or that the perpetrator takes the potential victims into their home. We would highlight that electronic monitoring can be used as an effective tool within domestic abuse. However, it can have unidentified risks. Yes, I will. Good way. Liam Kerr. For taking the intervention, just briefly then, does Jenny Gilruth agree with Scottish Women's Aid that breach of electronic monitoring conditions must be an automatic offence? Jenny Gilruth. Uh, I thank Liam Kerr for that intervention. I think we've had a bit of a discussion about that today. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced either way um, at this present moment, but I do think that Scottish Women's Aid make a, a valid point. Howard League Scotland were not, however, against the use of exclusion zones, arguing that exclusion zones uh, require to be limited in size, particularly in cases involving domestic violence. And as Social Work Scotland told us, it is imperative that boundaries are unambiguous and clearly outlined for those subject to restriction. Today's legislation is, of course, part of the government's wider work on reforming the justice system, protecting public safety and supporting victims of crime. And as previously debated in the chamber this week, there is a consensus to pull the justice system out of the Victorian era, as depicted by Children First, and into the 21st century. Part of that involves investing in alternatives to traditional imprisonment, but it's also about how the system supports victims of crime. And on that point, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's establishment of the Victims Task Force. This legislation brings forward a number of reforms to strengthen Scotland's justice system and to widen the alternatives to imprisonment. I am grateful to have the opportunity to make the case for a gendered analysis of what that means for both women offenders and victims of crime, particularly those who have been victims of domestic abuse. Presiding officer, electronic monitoring can have a great role to play in supporting our vision for a fairer and a safer and a more inclusive nation. This legislation commits to get the balance between public protection and the alternatives to managing offenders right, with the well-being of the victims of crime at its heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move to closing speeches and I call Daniel Johnson to close for Labour. I give you seven minutes, Mr Johnson. That's very generous of you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I, I do uh, think the clerks must have been listening to the debate because uh, the, the head clerk has joined us to hear the praise that has been heaped on the clerks through this. But I would like to reiterate this has been a difficult bit of work and, and the clerks have supported the committee extremely well. In summing up, I, I think it's hard not to acknowledge the shadow of the tragic uh, murder of Craig McClellan that has cast on this. And I think it's right that we reflect on uh, the issues that that has thrown up and reflect upon how we can improve this bill in light of that. And I think there are two key elements that I think I would just like to, to touch on um, uh, with regard to that, both I think raised by my colleague, uh, Neil Bibby, but also Liam MacArthur. The very nature of the two inquiries that were carried out by HMI PS and HMI CS, I think, meant that, that the, the, there were going, always going to be questions left. Those two inquiries were strategic and procedural in nature. They did touch on uh, specific elements of the Craig McClelland case, but by definition, um, they were not detailed inquiries specifically into that incident. 
And so I think that the question does remain about an independent inquiry. And I know uh, that the Cabinet Secretary has been reluctant, but I think um, I, I would ask him again whether he'd uh, consider it. And I think in particular because some of the issues that Liam MacArthur raised. Because I do believe that uh, I think the calls regarding automatic fatal accident inquiry for those who are on uh, non-custodial sentences or uh, 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 measures such as HDC, I think is a valid one and has merit and I will certainly be supporting Neil Bibby. The very backlog of fatal accident inquiries I think is an issue in and of itself. I think we need fatal accident inquiries when there are failures in our public services, uh, tragic incidents where we need answers and we need to have that understanding of the systemic issues. And that very backlog, I think, hinders that ability to give people confidence and understanding of what went wrong and so we can learn those lessons. And I would just like to make that initial reflection. But I'd also like to look at the, the broad issues that have been raised around HDC. And I think uh, members have brought to life a, a number of issues, which, and, and rightly so, around assessment, around how we uh, uh, consider risk and how that should be monitored. But I think we also must look at more fundamentally, because while I think those issues around interagency communication and those technical points are important, there are also some fundamental issues around capacity and competence, which this is, uh, uh, these uh, circumstances highlighted. I think in particular, if you look at the HMI CS report, uh, where it uh, states that there were 44 offenders to, which were unlawfully at large. And I think the very fact that so many of those were quickly able to be uh, uh, apprehended and that number reduced to single digits in such a short space of time, I think shows that those people could have been apprehended earlier, but it's simply that the resources were not brought to bear. Indeed, if you look at Jill Imrie's evidence to the committee, and when we took our subsequent evidence, she pointed out that the standard operating procedures as they stood were adequate, they just were not followed. And those were her words, not mine. Now, I think we need to look quite care, uh, just in a moment, I think we need to look quite carefully at how breaches were followed up and pursued by the police. And I don't believe those answers uh, have been established. I'll give way to John Finney on that. John Finney. Thank you, Senator. So I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention. Would the member acknowledge that the present arrangement see three organisations, so six different relationships, if it was simply one public body and the prison service? then they wouldn't have that complex set up of relationships. Daniel Jones. Um, I, I thank the member for that point, and I think he makes an excellent point. And I think those are very much some of the things that still need to be looked at. I think the complexity of those relationships, I think, are one matter. And I think he made a very good point in terms of his intervention uh, on uh, Jeremy Balfour. I think we need to question whether or not uh, the use of private sector organisations have added an extra loop in that information chain, and the added complexity, which we need not necessarily be there. But I also think that there has been something of a, of a, a missed opportunity. And I think, you know, when we were examining uh, electronic monitoring, and I think that the very possibilities that many members have raised about the new possibilities that GPS provides, I think should have prompted a re-examination of how these things are used, how they are best used, and whether the existing orders and provisions uh, could have actually been adapted, amended, improved to reflect the new possibilities of technology. And I, I would also thank members for reflecting my points raised by HMIPS about the lack of data. I want to support these measures. I'm fundamentally progressive in terms of my attitudes towards these things. But unless we have the data, unless we know what works, we quite simply cannot make the effective decisions that we want to. Um, I think the other key missed opportunity is around remand. And I'd just like to correct the record. I made a small error in the data that I used. It's 30 per 100,000 is the incarceration rate in Scotland. 20% of our prisoner population is the remand prison population. That compares not to the OECD, but with England and Wales to 16 per 100,000 and 11% of their prison population when they have very similar level, overall levels of incarceration. We need to ask ourselves why that is happening. And I think this is a missed opportunity to examine whether or not we could use electronic monitoring to tackle this stubborn problem we have in the Scottish prison system. Finally, I would like to bring uh, 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 my remarks towards the issue around the parole board. And I, I do that mindful of some of the, the members in the public uh, gallery. But I think Bob Doris made an excellent point. The parole board serves a central function in our justice system, a, a, a gatekeeper, a guardian at that point of, of uh, reintroducing people from prison 
to our communities. I think it is therefore really important that we examine these issues in the round. I think it is unfortunate that this was embarked upon and the, uh, when a, and another consultation was clearly uh, 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 in, in the works within the government. More importantly, this bill was brought forward after the tragic um, uh, and or certainly concerning issues regarding the War Boys case uh, in, in England. So therefore, I think it would have been relevant and indeed warranted to look at the status of the, the parole board, a look at how it functions, it's in transparency. And I think actually the parole board and their submissions themselves, I think made some very good points about how the position of the parole board and indeed the transparency of decision making could have been improved through this bill. And I would like uh, to, for those points to be considered as we proceed through stage two and three. I have no further time, presiding officer, but I would uh, just like to, to uh, reconfirm that we will still be supporting at stage one, but I think there is a good deal of testing um, and scrutiny that needs to be done on this bill, and I think this is a bill that does need to be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Gordon Lindhurst, who is the Conservatives, up to eight minutes, please, Mr Lindhurst. Mm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I close today's debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Now, as has already been said, these benches broadly support large parts of the bill before us. But we will, in the next stages of the parliamentary process, seek to amend the bill where we feel that that should be done. We are looking today not just at the way in which we deal with offenders, including their rehabilitation, but also at ensuring victims and wider society have confidence in our criminal justice system. And that confidence has unfortunately been eroded, particularly by some high profile cases. And it also shone through clearly in the evidence before the committee and some of which has been cited today. Uh, we heard calls for a zero tolerance approach to breaches of electronic monitoring backed by effective police powers to be able to deal with individuals who flout the rules. The current system is slow and ineffective, requiring a breach to be dealt with by a sheriff who assigns a hearing within four weeks. That Police Scotland action in these circumstances is limited by bureaucracy is sadly of little comfort to victims especially. They may have to endure a number of encounters with an offender despite an order in place to protect them. So it is a step forward that the breaching of a home detention curfew is to be looked at as being made a criminal offence and dealt with at stage two of this bill. But as we heard today, in some areas, the proposed legislation does not go far enough. Zero tolerance, if it is to mean anything, must include swift action and response, dealing with incidents as soon as they happen and preventing a slide into more serious behaviour. Serious questions arise as to why this bill has not proposed the cutting off uh, of a tag as an automatic criminal offence, as my colleague Liam Kerr referred to. And these are, that's one of the questions that must be addressed as we proceed through the next stages of this bill. Electronic monitoring does, of course, serve a purpose for offenders, allowing those with a history of offending to be active and become responsible contributors to their communities. Indeed, the Scottish Conservatives have previously called for greater use of satellite tracking and strict home detention. The Scottish Government has set out, and again I think this week repeated, that electronic monitoring could be used for individuals who would otherwise have served short-term prison sentences of less than 12 months. The problem, as we have heard, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that the Scottish Government seeks to expand community sentencing when the statistics show that it is not delivering justice for victims with nearly one in three community sentences being ignored, a quarter of community payback orders not including any unpaid work or activity, and only 40% of drug treatment and testing orders being completed. So the emphasis behind a presumption against jail sentences of under 12 months is that it cuts reoffending rates, and yet we need to think not just about the offenders in these cases, we also have to think about the sort of message we will be sending to victims and their families if the orders that replace prison sentences are breached and ignored to the extent that they are being ignored and breached now. Keeping at the forefront of our minds the experiences that victims have gone through is paramount. And as I think Bob Doris pointed out, 
we should not forget witnesses involved in these cases either, nor the effect that this sort of thing can have on them. Um, yes. Daniel Johnson. I, I think that the member makes some good points, and I recognise them. But he also uh, recognise the need to ensure that we have consistent application of justice and that the, the involvement of the victim's perspective in parole and other matters does need to be balanced against that consideration. Gordon Lindhurst. Yes, I, I certainly agree with uh, uh, the member that we need to have consistency in approach in the justice system whether we're dealing with offenders or victims, and that there are a number of interests that need to be balanced uh, against each other. And turning back to uh, the report, it highlighted areas where information is severely lacking, and in particular when it comes to victims. Without summaries of evidence, social workers only have one side of the story, and important information may be missed, in particular the risk to victims. So it was welcome to hear that the committee called for more detailed information to be supplied through summaries of evidence. Yes. Luke McGregor. I thank the, the member for taking the intervention. Does the member accept that as part of a social work assessment, part of that would be getting information from various sources? And although they, uh, I did reflect on the evidence that was heard by committee, that wouldn't be the case for every single assessment. Gordon Lindhurst. Yes, I think that, that is right. Obviously, that, that is the point of the point that I'm making, that one would be looking at trying to get information from more than one source to enable the um, social worker to better assess the position than the, they're able to at the, the present time. Now, in other um, areas of the bill, proposed legislation seeks to pose greater limits for sharing of information and it is here that I refer to disclosure. The committee was correct in highlighting, as others have pointed to, that there is a balance between society and an employer's right to know about prior convictions and the ability for a person to be able to move on with their life. There are rightly exceptions to that where required, but to play an active and responsible role within their community, an offender must have the opportunity to rejoin the workplace if it is appropriate. Now, lastly, Deputy Presiding Officer, I refer to part three of the bill, which deals with parole reform. And in this context, I'm not going to go over the points raised by others, but there's one matter which I, I would like to raise with the Justice Minister, and that is regarding the subject of vulnerable prisoners at parole board hearings and their need for appropriate representation. The question is as to what provision is made for prisoners who lack capacity, whether because of a learning disability dementia or other reason, and are not therefore able to instruct a solicitor to represent them. And I'm thinking here of the provisions which the Mental Health Tribunal possesses under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003, and which give that tribunal the power to instruct a solicitor in the form of a curator ad litem to an individual where that is appropriate. Now, I raise this for the first time with the Cabinet Secretary, so I don't expect a, a substantive response here and now, but I would ask if he would confirm that he is happy to look at this issue with me as part of the uh, Stage 2 proceedings in relation to the Bill. So, as I set out at the beginning of my speech, the Scottish Conservatives support the general principles of this Bill and look forward to working through the next stages to ensure a criminal justice system that works for offenders victims of crime and witnesses alike. Thank you very much. Now I call on Hamza Youssef to wind up for the Government. Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. This has been a good uh, debate, much like the debate uh, earlier this week on the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill. This has been a good debate, constructive uh, debate, but, but challenging. Uh, clearly members from, from uh, all the different political parties, including very much uh, my own, uh, want to see the government uh, go further, want to see this bill go further. Very rare, I have to say, that the government presents a bill at stage one that is the perfect uh, bill ready to go. So therefore, uh, as, as, as those members that know me, uh, I will listen, I have listened very carefully, but also uh, look to take their ideas uh, on board as much as I possibly can. Um, I just wanted to touch upon the, the general context, which a couple of members uh, also did so. We now have the, by many accounts, the highest prison population per 100,000 in Western Europe. Uh, not a statistic uh, to be proud of uh, in the slightest. Uh, one that does counteract uh, some claims of, of, of soft justice made in this chamber, but nonetheless not um, a statistic uh, at all to, to, to be proud of. So where we have made some gains 
uh, and some successes, I would say, towards a progressive uh, justice system. This is still one uh, that we have uh, not cracked. Uh, we know that short prison sentences do not work. They disrupt people's lives. They, uh, people lose their jobs. Uh, there is detriment to their family connections, uh, to their housing situation, and so on and so forth. That, that is not just our view. It is increasingly, I see, the view uh, also of, of the UK uh, government by positive statements from both Rory Stewart uh, and, and David Gawke just um, this week, the, the Secretary of State for Justice. Uh, in Scotland, we first piloted uh, electronic monitoring in Scotland in, in 1998. In 2011, the Scottish Government then introduced community payback orders. Uh, providing courts with a range of requirements uh, that they can impose uh, in community sentencing, including robust unpaid uh, work options. Uh, now, through this bill, we're taking steps, steps to enhance the options available as to how, how uh, we can choose to monitor individuals in the community, adding to our existing electronic monitoring capabilities. Um, I want to try to touch upon uh, some of the key themes that I thought were mentioned uh, throughout the, the, the debate. I thought a number of members touched upon the concerns from Scottish Women's Aid. Uh, I thought Jenny Ruth's uh, contribution just at the end of the debate on her gender analysis of the bill was very powerful indeed. And there's two strands to, uh, I think, the, the concerns around the issues of domestic uh, abuse. Uh, one is uh, GPS and the use of GPS. A number of witnesses have, have, have mentioned uh, some of their concerns. Can I just give some reassurance to the Chamber that my officials have had discussions with Scottish Women's Aid about the design of an electronic monitoring project focused specifically on domestic abuse. Uh, planning is at a very uh, early stage and, and, and I don't have further details as of yet, but I will uh, update the committee uh, on progress uh, in due course. So hopefully it gives some reassurance. The other element of concern that Scottish Women's Aid raised, the number of members raised uh, around domestic abuse was, was, was disclosures. Uh, and again, I hopefully addressed some of this in my, my opening. Uh, remarks, um, but can I just say that the views offered by Scottish Women's Aid uh, and other stakeholders will be an important factor to consider um, as changes are considered to the relevant list of offences uh, used within the higher level disclosure scheme and, and, and that is of course, as members know, part of a, another bill being taken forward uh, by uh, government. The changes um, in this bill will inform that consideration, uh, placing domestic abuse offences uh, and other relevant offences on the Schedule 8A list uh, within the Police Act uh, 1997 rather than the Schedule 8B list is under active consideration to address uh, the issues raised by Scottish uh, Women's Aid. So nonetheless, that is not to take away from uh, the very real concerns that Scottish Women's Aid uh, very clearly have and I'll continue to engage with them uh, as Cabinet Secretary. A number of members made the point around support for those on electronic monitoring. I thought uh, Daniel Johnson, maybe Fee, uh, John Finney, a number of members actually uh, made that point uh, during our debate and I thank them uh, very much for that. An important point, a number of members here told me that they visited the WISE group during the committee considerations. I was also at the WISE group um, on, 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 on Monday uh, as well with a very positive, a very good visit uh, with them. Uh, can I just give some reassurance and, and if members want to follow up with detail, that they, uh, if they want detail, I'm happy to provide that. Uh, but the Scottish Government is piloting uh, a number of forms of additional support currently. Um, we don't have to legislate to take that forward, um, but we are um, piloting a number of projects which add support uh, to, to, to go alongside uh, electronic monitoring. As I say, I'm happy to furnish um, uh, members with, with details. Of course. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, I can't hear Sorry. you. Your microphone. I wonder if they comment on the, why, uh, the wider comment that the WISE uh, group made to us, and that was emphatically about the resourcing of people um, who would be res released in uh, electronic monitoring um, in this debate. They said without the adequate pro pro provisions, they are being set up to fail. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I think that's a very powerful point, which, which you can be assured the WISE group made uh, to me during my visit uh, earlier this week. So. What I want to do is make sure that we have the, the right level of support, the right type of support available uh, to those uh, that, that, are going, that, that, are, that are part of the electronic, electronic monitoring regime. That's why the pilots are so important. Let's have those pilots, let's evaluate those pilots, uh, and let's see what's effective, and then we can hopefully upscale uh, some of that. So I, I don't take away from what the convener says or what uh, the WISE group say. 
very conscious of, of time, and there was a couple of other issues that members, uh, many members made reference to. Uh, one was bail. Um, a number of members, I, I think they used the term, uh, they saw it as, as, as a quote-unquote, a missed opportunity uh, about the bill, not uh, perhaps explicitly referencing. Um, can I give the government's view uh, on this is that, um, as currently drafted, we believe the bill enables both pre-conviction bail, uh, where the offender is obviously awaiting trial, and post-conviction bail, uh, where the offender has been convicted but awaiting sentencing, uh, to be added to the list of disposals uh, in Section 3 of the bill, which can be electronically monitored. Uh, this would be achieved via subordinate legislation under Section 4 of the bill, which enables Section 3 to be extended to include additional disposals which may be imposed on an offender uh, at any stage of criminal proceedings. That would include uh, bail. But in order to help clarify the power in Section 4 to make it clear that pre-conviction disposals can be added to Section 3, uh, we shall and I will uh, introduce an amendment to that effect at Stage 2 to give uh, clarification on that point. Of course. Carter. Uh, I'm very grateful for the Cabinet Secretary uh, giving way and, and very much welcome the, the commitment he's given, which is a bit of a departure from what the committee had previously been told that as the management of offenders' bill, um, uh, putting in uh, conditions pre-conviction uh, may be out of the, uh, the, the scope of the bill. But that, that assurance he's given, I would certainly welcome. Cabinet Secretary. I, I thank Lee MacArthur's uh, comments and, and, and I'm happy to provide that clarification. And I'll come forward at stage two with the appropriate amendment that will be tested. Uh, interrogated uh, und und undoubtedly. Uh, in terms of uh, another uh, important element that was mentioned by uh, all members uh, that contributed to this debate was the issue of risk assessment. Um, I think that uh, coupled with the issue around data, around what works, I thought was quite uh, two important issues. In terms of risk assessment, uh, I have provided the committee with, with further evidence. I know some of that uh, only came recently, um, but uh, I do want to just re-emphasize the point that on the back of the two inspectorate reports, there has been some key changes around uh, the risk assessment uh, process. Uh, individuals making decisions about release on home detention curfew will now have greater access to police intelligence, for example. We know that it's now prison governors uh, that will now decide on release on home detention curfew instead of unit managers. Uh, that adds an extra level of, of assurance. Uh, in direct response, again, to the independent reports, uh, immediate action has been uh, included uh, I will take an intervention in just a second, has been taken to include uh, introducing daily police tactical briefings, which include a focus on apprehending individuals who are unlawfully at large. Uh, but I, I acknowledge and recognise that the committee and, and members that have spoken here want to see more detail of that. I'm happy to provide that once the various working group and partners uh, do some more detailed work. And I'm happy to give way to John Finney. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary giving way. The Cabinet Secretary recognised that there is a danger associated with using intelligence rather than hard facts in relation to making the risk assessment. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I mean, he, he, John Finney always raises uh, these points from a, a base of knowledge from his past experience. I, I recognise what he says, and I mean, uh, of course, uh, we, we should be uh, well aware. Uh, of that, so I take that point, it's on, on, on the record. If I can just, uh, I'm conscious of my time, and I know a number of members uh, raised the, the tragic case of, of Craig McClellan, uh, once again, take the opportunity to put on, on, on record my condolences to the family of Craig McClellan as well uh, as the Scottish governments. We are in a position now where I understand that the, Craig McCle the, the McClellan family have written to the Lord Advocate in relation to uh, a fatal accident uh, inquiry. It would be appropriate for the Lord Advocate uh, who has responsibility for fatal accident inquiries, to now look at that. Uh, I would make the point, as I have made in this chamber previously, we've had two independent inspectorate reports. The regime uh, of HDC has been robustly changed and, and made more robust. Uh, and I will take an intervention in just a second. But I would just make the point that I understand from his intervention and contribution that Neil Bebby will bring forward amendments at stage two around uh, automatic FAIs or mandatory FAIs. And of course, the government will look at those uh, you know, as, as much as we can with an open mind. But I go back to the point that when it comes to FAIs, uh, that is the, the remit, understandably and rightly, of, of, of Lord Advocate. Uh, and I will continue on the point of, and I know it's five o'clock, so I will just end on the point of disclosures. Uh, if I may, I thought very strong points made by uh, many people, uh, uh, many members across the chamber around the impact, the stigma of disclosures as a number of government campaigns looking uh, at uh, and changing employers' attitudes uh, and, and two of the major campaigns, uh, one of them in particular, Release Scotland, 
it brings employers to the front of that conversation so they can talk to other employers about the benefits of taking on people uh, who have had previous convictions. I think I will end uh, the, the, my contribution uh, there, presenting officer, because I'm very conscious of time. It's been a very worthwhile debate. Uh, my approach to this when it comes to stage two will be to consult with members very closely to see what, um, uh, how we can strengthen this bill. Uh, but I'm thankful for the indications of support of stage one. And of course, I'm happy to move the bill uh, in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes stage one on the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion 11941 on the financial resolution for the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. And could I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion? Thank you very much. So we turn to decision time and there are two questions today. The first question is that motion 15733 in the name of Hamza Youssef on Management of Offenders Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the second question, the final question, is that motion 11941 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution on the management of offenders Scotland will be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>